ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on March 18th. I am Select Board Chair Eric Helmuth. Tonight's meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with provisions in state law for remote participation in public meetings. Before we begin, please note the following. This meeting is being conducted in the Select Board Chambers and over Zoom. It is being recorded and simultaneously broadcasted on ACMI. People wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. People participating either in person or by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, we ask you to provide your full name and place of residence in the interest of developing, developing a record of the meeting. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials found on the web town's website, specifically the Select Board's Agendas and Minutes page. If technical difficulties sever the remote connection to one or more participants and efforts to reconnect within a reasonable period of time fail, the in-person meeting will continue at the discretion of the chair, provided that a quorum of the board is physically present. Zoom participants are encouraged to retain the phone number provided in their confirmation email for a backup audio connection to the meeting. This evening there will be some opportunities for public comment during uh, items that are marked as a public hearing and also and especially during the Warren article hearings starting with item 14. We we'll also have uh, public uh, comment in item 13 and um, common ritual license working backwards and in the items that are previously marked um, at 9 and 10 for public hearings. So if you're attending by Zoom and want to make public comment at that time, please raise your hand in Zoom when I announce the public comment period for that item. If you do not know how to raise your hand in Zoom, now would be an excellent time to Google for how to do so. Let's see how much of the town's business we can get done tonight. And our first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. So we have on the consent agenda the Arlington Farmers Market banners um, applied for by Arlington Eats, reappointment to the Board of Registrars for Bill Logan, William Logan, term to expire March 31st, 2027, for approval Memorial Day ceremony on May 27th by our Director of Veterans Services, two requests for special one day beer and one wine licenses one on March 30th at Mark Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event, Jody Palmer, and another on April the 6th at Leslie Ellis for a private event by James Bethel. We have also on the consent agenda a request for the annual Arlington High School Ice Cream Fundraiser for the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at Wintermore Park on May 18th. And finally, on the consent agenda, a request for a contractor and drain layer license, Champion Environmental Services from New York from Stephen Lapisona. I'll now turn to the board for Mr. Diggins. I'll move uh, consent agenda, move approval of consent agenda. And I just want to add, I think it's really nice you know, on Memorial Day that uh, we've added uh, the old burial ground um, visit I mean, to, to the route. I mean, so apparently we'll go there after the main ceremony and, um, and then uh, proceed on to the cemetery. I mean, I think they opened that I mean, to the public, well, not to open, open to, the public, to the public, but we, we celebrated the revitalization of that space being um, last year on Juneteenth. It's a really good space, and I think it's really good, once again, that we've incorporated that into the Memorial Day celebrations. Do I have a second or other discussion? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? On a motion for approval of the consent agenda by Mr. Diggins and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is a unanimous 5 nothing vote. That brings us down to item 9. We have two public hearings. We'll take them separately. Both of these are Eversource petitions. The first is by Central Street at Mass Avenue. And we have Ms. Duffy here or in Zoom for that item. Uh, ready to go. Good evening, Ms. Duffy. Go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you. Able to do so. Didn't. How are you tonight? Very well. Thank you. I'm, I'm my car's in the shop. That's why I'm coming through from Zoom. Um, Eversource would like to install approximately 13 feet of conduit in Central Street 
The purpose of this work is for capital improvements to support the network and increase reliability in the area. Very well, and the board does have materials and documentation in its, uh, in its packet. Mrs. Mahan. Um, I know we have public hearing on this, but I'll move yes. approval. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll second it. Second. Get the bookends going tonight. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any, uh, before we have the public hearing, any questions or discussion from the board? Okay, at this time, we have a public hearing for this petition. If anybody in the room wishes to comment on this petition, uh, please raise your hand. And if you are in Zoom, please raise your hand in Zoom to comment on this item only. Ms. Marr? Seeing no hands raised. Okay. At this point, uh, the that concludes the public hearing. Do we have any further questions or comments from the board? All right, I think we're ready for a vote. So a uh, motion to approve this petition by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous vote. Now we have item 10, Eversource petition at Medford Street at Mass Avenue. And uh, uncoincidentally, we have Ms. Duffy to speak to this one as well. Please go ahead. Um, Eversource Electric would like to install approximately 10 feet of conduit at Medford Street. The purpose of this work is to, for the capital improvements to support the network and increase reliability in the area. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, before the public hearing, do we have any initial comments from the board? Motions? All right, let's go ahead and do the public hearing for this petition. So if anyone on Zoom or in the room would wish to comment on this petition, please raise your hand at this time. Ms. Mark? Seeing no hands raised. Okay. Move approval. All right. And do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion from the board? Oh, so, Mr. Dickens. So, in, in, in the um, engineer's report, I mean, there is mention about the fact that work had been done in that area recently, you know, and, and that we, we would hope that there would be measures taken to mitigate the effect on the businesses there that were being affected when they last did, did work there. So, and I just, I just, I mean, that was pointed out, I mean, and I don't know I mean, if there's any ex any um, explanation that we can get for what may happen, you know, when we do that work there from Eversource, but, I mean, if there is, I mean, I'm ears for it, but nonetheless, I'm going to approve it because it, it's work that needs to be done. Good. Did you want any comment from the town manager or from Ms. Duffy on that? Either would be fine. Mr. Feeney? Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid I have nothing to add, Mr. Chair. All right. That's fine. Like I said, okay, I just yeah, pointed no, out because it was there and it was interesting and, and I was kind of wondering myself, I mean, if that was the area where I was thinking. So, all right. Good. Yeah. We'll note, note your observation in the minutes. If you have, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, you can just email me and I can get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duffy. You're welcome. You're welcome. Mrs. Mahan. And I was just going to add, um, with several of the items in here, it's also the end result is subject to uh, review and approval by the engineering department. Mm. Thank you, Ms. Smart. Any further discussion by the board? Okay, we have a motion to approve this petition by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is 5 nothing. unanimous vote. Thank you. Have a nice night. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Okay. This brings us to item 11, appointments. We have an appointment to the Commission for Arts and Culture, and that is Greta Mastro. Hi, welcome. Please come on, come up to the table, and uh, thank you very much for your willingness to serve. Just have a seat and uh, just introduce yourself and say a few words about your interest in serving. We do have your wonderful letter, and uh, so just expand upon that as you wish. Well, yeah, as you already said, um, my name is Greta, um, and I'm a senior at Arlington High School, and I have been, like, involved with lots of different art projects my entire life, and, like, the arts and culture I've been involved with, with many things like um, Climate Futures Arlington, which was a public art installation that went around um, Arlington, and so then I was um, informed of a way to be, make this commission more accessible to youth like myself and make important town matters that affect people in Arlington more accessible to all. So um, I have have this like proposal to 
like be the first person to kind of make the system where um, youth can be more involved in this commission and things in Arlington in terms of like voting and taking part in matters such as like art installations, but also for example, the youth banner project. And I think it's very important for everyone to be involved in that sort of thing, especially from a younger age so that they feel that they are also just as much as a citizen as the adults at the table. So that was kind of my goal in applying for this. Wonderful, well said. I now turn to the board for discussion, questions and uh, motions. Mr. Hurd. Move approval and thank you for your willingness to serve. I know when I was a senior in high school, serving on a town commission wasn't top of mind, but it's <laughs> hopefully uh, you're setting an example, like you said, for other younger people to get involved because the decisions we make here affect your lives in the town. So thank you. <clears throat> Mrs. Mahan. <clears throat> I'd like to second that. And I'd like to thank Ms. Mastro, Greta, for, for doing this uh, and, and getting involved um, compared to me at a young age. <laughs> uh, I also see that you uh, are a long distance, distant runner. That was, I was cross country and track in high school and I got so many things done when I would <laughs> be competing in races or training. So I kind of already know your personality. Um, and uh, I, I really do mean it sincerely as does the, the full board for you um, not only volunteering for this committee, but you've done so much leading up to this with your internships and composting and um, probably lots of things that we don't even know about because um, I can tell you, you're a go-getter and you get a lot of things done and um, look forward to your service on this committee, but also what you're gonna do here in the Allington community in the future and beyond because um, I see a little kindred spirit. So my first organizing effort was in high school, way back when. So um, I'm glad you're, you're starting off and, and giving us volunteering your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Master, for your uh, willingness to serve. I was very impressed by your submission here and all of your experience, and, and the fact that you started a novel at age 10 uh, is really impressive. So I, I want to thank you and wish you the best of luck uh, for the remainder of your senior year at the high school. I could say a lot. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 could, I could definitely say a lot, you know, but I'm afraid it would all seem like it's talking about me because as with um, Mrs. Mahan, you know, I mean, there are lots of similarities, you know, not with the running, definitely not with the running, you know, uh, but certainly with the interest in, in, in art. Uh, and, and as Mr. Um, DeCourcy said, I mean, uh, and, and you're writing a novel too. So and I, what, really, what I really like about that, though, is that you haven't let me the setback discourage you. In fact, it probably is encourage you to try even harder, and that's an important thing to, um, to learn in life because there are just lots of uh, setbacks. And certainly, with the big goals that we have I mean, for uh, making the world better in terms of I mean, the environment, uh, you know, there are going to be lots of setbacks with that. But we just have to keep keep trying. Uh, so, so more power to you. Look forward to um, um, working with you in some way as part of ACAC. So, thank you once again. And uh, I want to echo my colleagues' gratitude for your willingness to serve and express my special appreciation for your work in climate and sustainability. Um, I was fortunate to, to be involved with the, um, rec in recognizing the launch of the Climate Futures Project, and I think it's a really good example of how important art is. Art is always important, but it can help the community look at things in new ways and ask questions and say, well, why is this here? And I think that, that project has succeeded because I see the discussion in the community, people puzzling and wondering what it's about, and they're stopping and they're thinking. And we need to do that about this and so many other issues. So I'm really excited for your service on this commission. I think that they're lucky to have you with your fresh ideas. And I look forward to, to seeing what you do next. Any further discussion? Okay, so we have a motion to appoint by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous vote. Congratulations and thank you again. The timing of, the, of this appointment and, and, uh, and Greta's work, I think, is especially, will become especially uh, poignant when we take up item 13 tonight, the uh, community electricity renew renewal. So moves us to item 12, uh, license and permits is the continuation of a hearing 
uh, for approval of a common vigiler license from Boston Pizza and Euro at 1323 Mass Ave. And um, is Mr. Bezatis in present tonight or in Zoom? Okay. I appears to be not the case. Uh, at this point, I ask the town manager to give the board an update on uh, the conditions that the board expressed um, to the applicant two weeks ago about what conditions the board would be liking, likely to be looking for in order for us to approve this license. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as the board may recall, on, uh, at its meeting on March 4th, uh, we obviously had a preliminary hearing and identified a number of conditions that needed to be met prior to uh, tonight's continued hearing. So with respect to that, there was an inspection of this establishment conducted by the Arlington Fire Department and Arlington Inspectional Services Department on March 6th, at which point uh, a number of conditions were identified for correction. Those conditions uh, were provided in the packet, but if I were to uh, outline them for the uh, benefit of the public, there was a rear egress door that was uh, insufficient and led to a set of stairs that had no landing. Uh, the basement stairs were not illuminated. Uh, there was far too much signage on the front of the building, and it exceeded the maximum allowable uh, size per our zoning bylaw. Uh, the f one of the fire alarm pull stations was uh, clearly obstructed and not able to be accessed, uh, and there are pictures of each of those conditions uh, in the establishment. Separately, a hearing was held with uh, staff at the Board of Health on Thursday, uh, March 7th, at which point uh, there was a follow-up report provided by Lead Health Compliance Officer Pat Martin and signed by Mr. Bayaztas, identifying a number of conditions that need to be met over time, including uh, working with a food consultant, uh, food safety consultant moving forward. Uh, I will know that the dates on that were to begin on or before April 5th and that uh, Mr. Bayastis was to notify health department staff of whom the food consultant was going to be that they hired. Uh, as of today's date, no action has been taken uh, with respect to hiring a food safety consultant to conduct comprehensive inspections and trainings at this particular establishment to uh, hopefully prevent routine uh, inspections yielding the same uh, critical <clears throat> violations at each uh, routine inspection. Uh, with respect to the items that were identified during the March 6th on-site uh, field inspections by inspectional services and uh, the fire department, we had scheduled uh, a follow-up inspection in advance and that inspection was to take place at 10 a.m. today and that uh, the date and time had been properly and uh, regularly noticed uh, to the applicant. Uh, however, uh, upon arrival today, unfortunately, uh, the business was locked up tight, the lights were off, and no one was present. Uh, the, the best we could tell in terms of looking at the signage on the windows, and again, using daylight to peer through the windows and observe some of the other observable conditions, uh, it regrettably looks like not uh, one step has been taken to correct any of the violations or deficiencies that were noted uh, during the March 6th inspection. Uh, and, and beyond that, not much to report given that, uh, again, the, you know, the owner had been notified multiple times about his need to appear this evening, but uh, we received no response. Thank you, Mr. Feeney. I'll turn to the board. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move to deny the application for the common vigiler license. And uh, Mr. Feeney pointed out everything that's happened since the last meeting. We made it very clear what needed to happen in the two weeks from March 4th to March 18th. Um, I do note, and I think several of us have probably gone by the business since that meeting. And um, every time I went by, it was during posted business hours, but the, 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 the store was closed in every instance. And I believe that's consistent with what Mr. Champ is experience was up and through this morning. So I, I don't think the business has even been open since, since March 4th, but um, given what needed to be done and, and what was made clear, it's, it's, we, we can't even think about um, approving this. So um, uh, that's my motion. Thank you. Second. 
Whoever got there first. <laughs> I don't think I got anything else. Mrs. Mrs. Mahan by hair. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you have something? No. no. Um, a question I have for the town manager is, uh, if I'm reading the room right here, that we'll, we'll deny this license when we take a vote. Uh, what measures can the town take to ensure uh, compliance with this, uh, the non-issuance of this license? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, of course, if the board were to proceed with ultimately uh, denying this application, the applicant would not receive a license uh, and would not be allowed to operate their business without a license. I do believe, though I haven't heard this firsthand, that the owner uh, has been looking to sell the business and will be making attempts to do so. But were they to attempt to operate without a license, uh, there's a series of escalating fines that could be issued through the non-criminal disposition or ticketing process. And then ultimately, if you know the owner continued to attempt to operate without a license, uh, there is a criminal enforcement mechanism uh, allowed for under statute. So we would uh, continue to regularly monitor the establishment to ensure they were not opening, which we have been doing, uh, whether it be through uh, calls during business hours or sending various inspection agencies uh, by the business at various times of day, but that would be how we would proceed. Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to note that the legal department will work with the town manager's office, inspectional services, and all other agencies to make sure that uh, the, the business is not open uh, without a license and that we will work with them on making sure that enforcement provisions are put in place to make sure that doesn't happen. And if I could further ask the town manager to uh, brief the board on, I believe there's a new procedure in place with the issuance of, you know, moving forward, issuance of uh, occupancy permits and how, you know, we've put a measure into place to prevent the situation, which we didn't see coming because it's never happened before, but prevent this from happening again? Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Cherry. You're correct that it is not often the case that uh, an establishment seeking a license will uh, sort of neglect their responsibility to adhere to the requirements of the local licensing authority. Uh, and of course, you know, the board's office staff reached out to this establishment multiple times to correct this issue. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it ultimately persisted perhaps for longer than it should have. But we now find ourselves in a situation where we have uh, an electronic or an online permitting platform through OpenGov that's operated via inspectional services that allowed us to, you know, once this was identified, program a prompt or an inquiry, if you will, into the process of obtaining a certificate of occupancy so that we could determine when someone was applying for their certificate of occupancy, if they are going to serve either food or alcohol, that it will uh, sort of create an entry for that and will automatically notify select board office staff so that we don't have someone proceeding to the um, phase of receiving a certificate of occupancy and believing that they're uh, duly authorized to conduct business unless and until they have obtained all proper licensure. Thank you. Um, and can you confirm that when, when a business just changes hands, you know, if, even if it continuously um, were to be operating, is, does that involve the triggering of a new need for a new, a new occupancy? That is correct, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion from the board? Anything further from you, Mr. Beeney? Okay, so we have a motion to deny the, per, uh, the license uh, from Mr. DeCourcy and seconded uh, by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? It's a five nothing unanimous vote to deny. Okay, that brings us to item 13, the Arlington Community Electricity Contract Renewal. I believe Ms. Fox will be coming up to make a presentation. We have some slides available in Zoom. I will be taking public comment on this. Um, so what we'll do is have Ms. Fox do a presentation. We'll have a round of questions um, and discussion for the board. Then we'll open it up. I'll open it up for public comment. Then we'll have a final round where the board members can make motions and, and have further discussion before we vote. Uh, one thing I will clarify this evening is, um, and I think Ms. Fox may, may uh, hit this as well, is that the uh, all the, the board? I think if my member, if, if my colleagues uh, are so inclined, you know, can vote, vote to make a recommendation to the town manager. The decision, uh, the business decision about choosing the actual rates, uh, are up to the town manager himself. So we'll go into that this evening.
Good evening, Ms. Fox. Can you introduce okay. yourself, and uh, do we have a presentation available? Uh, yes. Good. In the meantime, good evening. My name is Talia Fox. I'm the sustainability manager for the town. Thank you so much for your time this evening. I will be presenting briefly on the context for the upcoming contract renewal for the Arlington Community Electricity Program and the opportunity to increase the level of renewable energy in the program's default product. You can and you can give us a second here to try to yeah. work out our technical problems yeah. with the... With the top the one may not be working, so I may just share. On yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like that conked out. Sorry, hold on one. It's okay, we're making good time tonight, so... And I'll just reiterate that following this presentation, the goal is for the select board to provide the town manager with guidance regarding a target percentage range for the default product to inform the supplier bidding process that will occur in approximately two weeks. All right. Great. So as you may know, electricity customers in Massachusetts are required to pay for electricity distribution through the utility, but we can choose to purchase electricity supply from competitive suppliers. Arlington Community Electricity, or ACE, was launched in 2017. It is a town vetted municipal aggregation program enabled by state law that allows the town to purchase competitive elect electricity supply in bulk on behalf of residents. This has several benefits, which include increased environmental impact because ACE enables us to purchase clean electricity, like wind and solar, beyond what the state requires. The program provides stability in that ACE rates are fixed for the contract duration, which is typically two to three years, while utility rates fluctuate with the markets. The program also has historically provided competitive rates, resulting in significant savings over the lifetime of the program. Future savings cannot be guaranteed. The program offers consumer choice in that ACE has different product options with different levels of additional renewable energy and corresponding prices. And finally, the program also provides continuity. For example, uh, discounts for income qualified residents are unaffected by participation in ACE. Next slide, please. The town is currently in a two-year contract with supplier Nextera Energy Services, which began in November of 2022 and concludes in November of this year. Our current program has four products, one of which is our default product. And this is the product that anyone who opens an electricity account in Arlington gets automatically added to unless they choose to opt out. Approximately 90% of accounts in the Arlington Community Electricity Program are enrolled in this product. Um, this product uh, has 30% additional renewable energy, class one renewable energy, above the state requirements. And class one means that the additional renewable energy comes from local solar, wind, anaerobic digestion, and low impact hydropower sources. We also have three other products in the program. We have products that add 50% and 100% additional renewable energy above the state requirements. And we have a product that does not add any additional renewable energy above what the state requires. Next slide, please. I'd like to emphasize some of our program successes. We have very high participation. We have over 15,000 accounts enrolled in the program, which is approximately 75% of all of the eligible accounts in town. And I want to correct that. Oh, thank you. The correction was made. So that's about 75% of the 21,000 eligible accounts. Uh, many people have opted up to the 100% option, over 1,200 uh, accounts as of December 2023. And this is really due to the success of our opt-up campaign, which is led by community volunteers. We have seen tremendous savings cumulatively over the lifetime of the program, totaling about $10 million, which is on average $672 per account. And I want to note that over 3.4 million of these savings are actually just from this contract alone because of the spike in Eversource prices last winter. And ACE's environmental impact is significant in that ACE customers are currently collectively purchasing more than 33,000 megawatt hours of additional renewable energy annually, which is equal to the output of approximately seven land-based wind turbines. Next slide, please. We have an opportunity, this contract, to select a default rate of renewable energy that is higher than our current 30% default rate. 
and I'd like to offer some considerations to this point. The town's net zero action plan has a goal of achieving 100% renewables in the ACE default product by 2030 in total. So that's total, including the state requirement for class one renewables. The current ACE default, should I hold for a second here? One second. Okay. Yeah, it gives a second to. Okay, so the current ACE default has a total of 54% class one renewables because we are adding 30% on top of the 24% that is required by the state in 2024. And that state requirement is going up 3% per year until 2029, at which point it increases, it increases 1% per year. So by 2030, when the state requirement is 40%, we'd need 60% additional renewables in the default to achieve the 100% goal. So we're at 30% now, we need to get to 100% in 2030, and we will likely have one more contract after this next contract to increase the default to get to our 100% total goal in 2030. So there are also some cost considerations because the additional renewables add an additional cost for residents. The good news is that global energy markets have settled some since our last renewal, and the cost of the underlying electricity may decrease some if current projections hold. And this slight decrease would allow the town to increase the default level of renewables to 45 or 50% additional without increasing the average Arlington customer's bills. If the town were to increase the default to 55 or 60% additional renewables, that might yield an increase in bills for the average resident on the order of roughly $45 per year, up to $45 per year compared to the current default rate. Next slide, thanks. It's reasonable to assume that the cost of the underlying electricity is going to decrease one to two cents per kilowatt hour compared to the current ACE contract. And while it's not possible to precisely predict what the rates will be in the bids, based on where the market is today, this table here presents estimated ranges of total bill changes to the average Arlington residential customer for different amounts of additional renewable energy in the def default product. So for example, if we say, taking the left column, the town were to increase the level of renewable energy in the default product to 45% additional class one, it's estimated that the average resident would see annual bill reduction compared to the current ACE contract of approximately $10 per year if the price of the underlying electricity falls one cent per kilowatt hour or up to $65 reduced per year if the price of the underlying electricity falls by two cents per kilowatt hour. So there's ranges in that second column of what changes we might see in, in bills. And what I flagged here are two potential options just for discussion. That 45% default is approximately halfway to our goal of 100% in 2030. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, we're currently at 30% and we need to get to 60% in 2030. Halfway between 30 and 60 is 45%. Now the town could also choose to adopt a roughly 100% total default sooner than 2030, which would mean adding approximately 70% additional renewable energy on top of the state requirements. And that would yield bill changes for the average resident ranging from roughly $46 more per year to roughly $9 less per year, as represented in that last row. Next slide, please. Now an additional consideration for the contract renewal pertains to the ACE program product options. If the percentage of renewables in the ACE default product increases to roughly, roughly 50%, the town might want to eliminate that middle 50% option because that would be duplicative. There's also an option to add, to redefine the ACE 100% product as 100% total rather than 100% additional class one renewables. And redefining this product would both decrease the cost of that product slightly, as well as decrease the amount of renewables that customers enrolled in this product are supporting. And many of the, the residents enrolled in this product are voluntarily going above and beyond. And whether these changes make sense depends somewhat on how close the default product is to 50% additional or 100% total renewables. So these are just some considerations we might wanna discuss right now. Next slide, thank you. So briefly to summarize ne next steps, tonight the goal for the select board is to provide guidance to the town manager on the approach for the procurement. That procurement will take place in early April, after which point the town will finalize the contract with the lowest bidding supplier and this fall, we will begin marketing the new contract rates and products to prepare for the transition to that new contract. 
And with that, I will conclude my presentation. We also have the chair of our Clean Energy Future Committee, Ryan Katowski, and our consultants from Good Energy, Rafida Rahman and Stefano Loretto. Stefano, I believe, is on Zoom. And they are all available to answer any questions uh, that you might have. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I want to invite the chair of the Clean Energy Future Committee to come up. If you have any additional comments you want to make, Ryan, we'd be happy to hear them as part of this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know that I have any additional prepared comments to make. Um, I think Italia's laid out a sort of a two or three sort of choices that need to be made with respect to the default product and also with respect to how we handle the, what we call the opt-up products. And um, I think at this point, it just makes sense to hear your questions and respond accordingly. Sure. Um, and Hoover's uh, doing the slides right now. Could we keep the slide uh, up for the purpose of the discussion to a couple back where we have the table of um, that one here? Just keep that kind of in front of us. I think that will inform the parameters of our, for our discussion as well. Um, at this point, does, Mr. Feeney, do you have any comments you want to make to the board before we get started? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. I have nothing specific to add, but we'll just note that I do appreciate the board uh, in sort of setting some guidelines or parameters to follow once we're ultimately uh, in the room on bid day with respect to potentially maybe setting a floor for where we hope to see that default product could be uh, helpful on that day. I also would like to take the opportunity for thanking both Talia and Ryan for all the work that went into this presentation. and. The only other thing I would add is the assumptions uh, for the decrease in the underlying electricity will likely hold pretty close to true in that range. And that's something we saw recently in uh, buying for our municipal and school building portfolio, which is separate from ACE, but that we uh, procure separately. And we have done that recently and saw a similar uh, price reduction. So the, these numbers uh, should hold pretty much true. Okay, so before we have uh, public comment on this, I'll turn to the board for any initial questions or discussion. Mr. Dickens. So you only want questions. You don't want us to like tip our hand or anything at this point? That is all up to us individually. Okay, uh, all right. I, if, I might suggest that just traditionally, we usually uh, do our motions and things after, after we hear public comment. Yeah, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a motion now, yeah. but, but I'm inclined to tip my hand because that could be influence the comments that that we get, you know, uh, so, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, you know, so, um, so just to understand, if we max out in, uh, at 70, there's the maximum, potential maximum cost to someone would be $46 a month, I mean, a year, a year, a year, a year. A year. even a month to yeah, me, yeah, it's, uh, it's, th those are, those are annual figures, yeah. and uh, it's, it's based on the assumptions right. in the table, so if, if the, underlying electricity price goes down by one cent, yeah. and we add 70 percent additional renewables right. to, the, to the default product, yeah, that's the, that's the annual rate impact. All right. And so so, so I, I talk with both you know, <laughs> of, of our guests me, a little bit, so I don't have a whole lot of questions. I just want to get some things out in the public um, sphere, you know, so that they understand where, why I'm, I'm where I am, you know, so, but this is one thing we didn't discuss, I mean, so I'm, I'm sorry to throw this one at you. I mean, so it seems like the worst case scenario is that it goes down one cent. We're, we're assuming that the range is going to be, yeah, one cent to two cent less. Okay. So, I mean, I, I, that's, that's what we've been informed by our, our consultants from Good Energy, is that that's roughly the range in decrease that we will be looking at. Okay. All right. And, and and once again, explain the assistance that people can get if, let's say, we go to 70% and it goes up $46 in a year. I mean, what can, assistance can people get in, that they're getting now that will be retained? Yes, yeah, so there's a, a few options if, if somebody is not comfortable paying that additional cost. They could opt down to the ACE Basic product, which doesn't add any renewable energy above what's required by the state, and that'll be a slightly cheaper product. And then for anybody who is income eligible, um, we have uh, outreach programs where we advertise the um, energy efficiency upgrades that are um, often at, at much reduced cost. Um, we have the um, 
discount rates through the utilities. So Eversource offers a 42% discount for any income eligible customers. There is also fuel assistance and, and all of these programs were uh, working hard to advertise through our Electrify Arlington program, um, especially with the hire of our new energy advocate through the uh, Community First Partnership grant. So there are options for, for individuals who aren't comfortable with that additional cost. Thank you. And do you have a sense of how much, I mean, how many people are getting assistance now? I think it's several thousand. Um, in Arlington. In Arlington. Yeah. All right. I would like to confirm that number. Okay. Yeah. Off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a cu couple of questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, so the last time that we did this, we went up from, I think, 11, to, the default from 11 to 30 percent? Correct. And do we, what do we know about how many people opted down or left the program after that? I understand that's difficult or impossible to know if that was th the reason, but can you give us some insight into that? Yes, so around when the contract turnover occurred in fall of 2022, we did see a couple hundred um, opt down, but relative to the total enrollment to the program, that didn't feel very significant. And then it actually, enrollment actually increased quite significantly um, once the contract began. That was probably because the winter Eversource rates were so high, but that just speaks to the potential benefit of the program. Again, we can't guarantee future savings, but that is you know, one, of, one of the objectives of the program is to provide that stability when there is volatil volatility in the market. So um, we saw a, s a very slight dip and then, and then an increase following that. So I would, I would not say that that increase to 30% significantly affected enrollment um, in, in the default product or in the program overall. I don't know if anybody from Good Energy would like to sure. implement yeah, that they're... response. If, if... And, if, and if they are on Zoom too, we could just bring them in so they'd be easy, they could uh, respond quickly. And what was the name? I'm sorry. It's uh, Stefano. Thank you. So while we're bringing in, uh, bringing in, uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, good evening. Thank you for, for thank you for joining us, Stefano. Um, did you, uh, I know Atali asked if you had any insight in that particular question. It's fine if you don't, but we want to con establish connection with you here. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I will, you, you know, the program has been really very successful and we constantly are monitoring the, the participation. Obviously, if somebody moves out of town or if somebody even moves within town, um, we have these periodic sweeps to pick up these newly eligible accounts. So there's there's kind of an ebb and flow to these programs. And I just have, have the numbers up here now. And, you know, really, we haven't seen any material drop since the last contract. We really are at almost all time highs with participation. Um, nothing outside of the normal you know, steady decline that you see for a couple of months as there's the people moving within town or out of town. And then we do a sweep to pick up the newly eligible accounts. And then it hops right back up to we've kind of always hovered around this 14,000 number down down to 12, up to 15, down, down to 13, up to 15. And, and we're right at 14 now. So I would say as far as thinking about the impact, um, I, I, we're, we're not concerned, right? If, 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 if this was the first contract and it was launching with potentially 40 or 50% more, that obviously poses a significant disadvantage to the Eversource basic service rate. But at this point, going on this, the, you know, the fourth contract, um, there's such a solid track record here. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel at all uncomfortable if, if the town wanted to pursue w whatever it chose here. Obviously, there's significant community backing, and and there also is the basic option, as somebody said, that if somebody chooses not to um, want to participate in the default, 
there is always that basic option, which might be significantly less based on whichever of these options ends up being the default. Okay. And when we did the, the increase last time, can someone remind me if, if we know, um, did that increase, did that result in a net small increase in the average, you know, in the, in the bill of the people who were, you know, then on the default rate? So last contract was in the middle of, it was right after Russia invaded Ukraine, which had a very significant um, impact on, on natural gas prices, which then affected electricity prices. And so we actually saw quite a large jump in the, the prices for the program overall, so an increase in the yeah. underlying price of electricity. So there was an increase. I, I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head, but there was um, an increase associated with that last contract. Okay, cool. Mr. DeCourse. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fox, for the, uh, for the presentation. Just a question on recommended term. Like two of the last three contracts were two-year terms. I, I believe 2019 through 22 was a three-year term. And, and again, this is guidance for Mr. Feeney, but I think it does go to what we may talk about in terms of um, setting a default figure. Is a recommendation that we'll probably seek a, a three-year term, or is it not known yet what... Uh, what, what you'd be recommending to us, because that's the difference between two or three contracts between now and 2030. That's true, that's a good point. Um, my understanding is the recommendation is for a three year, um, and, and perhaps, Stefano, you can weigh in here, but because the market is relatively favorable right now, I, I think it would make sense to lock in for a, a longer period of time, just in light of the uncertainty of the future. Um, so I don't know if, Stefano, you have anything to add to that, but my understanding is the recommendation is for a three-year contract. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Right now, when we look at the forward price of electricity, um, it, it's, it's considerably lower in some of those forward years, the, the future years that go further out. And so that, that provides a, an opportunity when you see value in those years. Uh, it's often the opposite where you know, similarly to a 30-year mortgage being more than a 10-year mortgage or, you know, a 30-year life insurance policy being more than, than a 10-year life insurance policy. When you see the compression in the forward curves, that means that now you can get a longer term, often at little to no premium. So um, that's what we're seeing in the market now. The, some of the key metrics, obviously we've had a really mild winter this year, a mild winter last year, and a mild summer, which brought us from really unprecedented levels of, of energy pricing to, to really what is now an excellent buying opportunity for the long term. So um, that's what we would recommend, a three year. Um, uh, that's what we're, we have several communities that are renewing this spring. Um, that's also why we're looking to do this renewal now. Often we get asked, why are we doing this now? The contract doesn't expire until November. Um, that's that's the, one of the positives with energy contracts. You don't, you don't have to wait until they're imminently expiring. You can see value in the market and execute it. And then to the end user, it becomes a seamless transition from one supplier to the other. So we have um, almost two dozen renewals that we're looking to do right now at the same time, and, and we're recommending three years for all of them. And, and, and given that things are so favorable, is three years the maximum that you can do? I mean, it, again, you don't want to go out too far, but is, is, is it, given that things are so favorable, would you ever consider a longer period? We do. We do. Uh, the, the issue really comes around the fact that in, in New England, one of the big components of your energy price, electricity price, is something called capacity. And there's an auction that goes out. It's a, it goes out three years. So suppliers know what that price is going to be three years out. Once we go beyond that, you know, it's a bit of an unknown. And we suppliers are going to account for that with significant premiums that that might make it unfavorable so we're we're we are trying to figure out a, a mechanism to do that but for this contract it won't be something that that will be uh, available so three years will be the longest term okay thanks it's effectively a max and then just a question on on our rate in the past we've always chose one rate on top of the state um standard that is not something that can, that, that's got to be fixed to the contract. Even though the state figure is going up 3% per year, is, is 
does the town default figure have to be constant? So no, um, we could actually do something. So let's say we decided we wanted with this contract to pursue a 100% total default. Um, Stefano might be able to explain this better, but my understanding is we could blend the rates for the different um, additional percentages of renewables across the three years of the contract. So we'd still have a fixed rate, but each year the additional renewables that we're, at, we're adding would um, in, or decrease as the state's requirements increase, um, which would still allow for that fixed price, but would, would sort of allow us to shift our, our percentages accordingly. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have right now. Mr. Diggins? Well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Mahan, because I mean, was that the question you asked, Mr. Corsi? Was that the question you asked? Because I was hearing a different question. You know? No, no, no. Yeah. Well, that, that yeah. was an example. No, no, that, right. that, that was responsive to my question. All right, then I'll have a different question. So, but I'll, I'll defer, you know, so. Mrs. Mahat. Sorry, I didn't tickle. I wasn't. Oh. Um, just sort of procedurally housekeeping. Right now, and it's a recommendation, to achieve the 100%, is that 100% a, a rate that the manager would increase it to, or is it 100%, which is really 70% right now because the state renewable program portfolio is 30. Um, and if we did do this for three years, when, I, I, I believe I heard either tonight or earlier when I met with Ms. Fox, um, that the state will go from 30 to 40%. Um, when do we anticipate that happening? Within this three-year contract or after that? So. The state's requirement for class one is at 24% right now, and it will increase 3% every year until 2029, at which point increase, it increases 1% per year. And so if we were to take an approach where we went for a 100% default now, um, we would sort of do what I would, was suggesting to Mr. DeCourcy, which is uh, we would basically add only as much as what the state only as much to make the total uh, 100%. So we would be adding uh, on top of the 27% for next, next year to, to get to that 100%. So we would never be exceeding, if we took that approach, mm -hmm. we would not be exceeding the 100%. Um, this table to that end is a, a little bit misleading because I don't think we would want to take an, the, the town could choose to take an approach where we are, we're always uh, going with 100% total but that would require that each year we're decreasing the amount of renewables that we're adding on top of the state uh, requirements. Did, did I answer your question? You did, and I, I think okay. what I heard in that answer is if we go for the 100% and for some reason if the state goes off their right now initial calculation, which is 24%, 30%, 40%, that just because we have a three-year contract, those adjust adjustments can be made accordingly or no, that would have to be negotiated on the next whatever term year contract. That's probably a question for Stefano in terms of the flexibility of the contract if the state policy were to change. Or maybe Part just from, take, take, uh, yeah, maybe just sorry. take that as when you're you're having the conversation and ultimately the town manager makes the decision. If there is an option for some reason, if the state does get a little bit more aggressive, um, is that something that will be taken into consideration with the contract, or is that something that needs to be renegotiated in the next contract? So I, I don't need a definitive answer on that tonight. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't take bets, but the three percent per year increase that we have now was the, was the state getting more aggressive. I forget what year it was, but the, when the renewable portfolio standard was first put in place, it was 1% per year, essentially with no sunset. And then there were, I think, at least once or twice legislation that upped that um, in the interim. So we're currently in that interim period where the state has said, between now and 2029, we're going to do 3% a year, and then we're going to revert to that baseline 1%, but it's conceivable they could come back and change it. My sense is 3% per year growth is, is um, probably as high as the state would want to go, but I wouldn't, you know, I would never say for certain. But. Right. And, and, and I just say that's similar to later on we'll be making our recommendations because we need to hear from others, but if all this really great energy and advocacy um, continues, which I think 
it's going to be reflected on the board's recommendation, town manager, Ms. Fox's, and Mr. Katowski's, and everyone else's. Same thing could happen on the state side, but I may be, I, I, maybe I'm Fair too enough. optimistic. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hurd. Yeah. I'll just note that I was lucky enough to meet with Ms. Fox last week, and she explained and went through all my questions. So my lack of questions is not <laughs> la lack of enthusiasm. And, and I want to thank her for attempting to explain to me what it is we're buying when we're buying renewable recs. Um, I'll cut into it for next one to make sure I understand that. For, but for now, I'll take your, your advice on it. Um, I had one more question, if I can just remember what it was. Um, I guess it's it's the it, what we were to do is sort of the new 100% model, and I think you know right now, like I in my household, we do we opt up voluntarily to the 100%, which you know means that we're actually buying additional recs, which you know I don't mind doing, but I think that that's not everybody may know that, um, and you know we're the board. I don't know where the board's going to be tonight. I think we'll we'll find out um, in in a little while, but you know if we were to go with an effective a rate, a high rate that would get us to effective 100% uh, renewables very quickly, uh, and we and so we would do that. If we were to take the recommendation of having, as I understand it, kind of a dynamic criteria for the 100%, so that that we would adjust our mix to keep it at a real 100%, would we? Would you recommend that we have an have a voluntary additional uh, layer on top of that for people who'd want to purchase additional? Rex effectively, you know, as sort of I do now unwittingly, or, or you know, is that, is that a good idea? Is that just not worth doing? Yeah. I think it could be, it's, it's certainly an option that the town could pursue to, to basically keep that same product as it is. I think in speaking with um, various residents in town, there are a number of residents who have very willingly opted up and, and understand that they're paying for more. I think certainly we would want to um, clarify how we market that option, which I, th I think we could do now, even if we were pursuing a different default, but um, we, we should absolutely make it clear that that product is sort of a 100% plus, or however we want to market it. Extra that, credit that or something. It, yeah, <laughs> and the extra yeah. credit product, uh. um, so, so that it's very clear to whoever is choosing that product that it's above and beyond. Good. Um, I had one more follow-up to that. Yeah. Um, and, and this might be for Mr. Katoski. Um, when trying to, to figure out, you know, it, it, the state, I guess, I guess let me just state this clean, plainly, it does affect sort of how we think about our 100% now and later. Um, the, the minimum, the state requirement now is just minimum 124% uh, uh, class one renewables that's required. And then the ones that we're buying, which are, and I forget the terminology, but they're, for, they're specifically for New England based. They're the uh, same. The, yeah. oh, they're yeah. the same. Mm -hmm. the, and, that's, and it's very intentional that our, our voluntary recs that mm -hmm. we buy are the same as the uh, obligation under the state policy. Okay. So there's not a difference in quality They're of those exactly recs. They're exactly the same, and that's exactly, yeah. it's, it's very intentional because that's what creates the additionality because you're, you're increasing demand for that same clean energy. So we're, we're okay. sucking up more of it, which means that someone else has to go build more mm -hmm. clean energy that qualifies as class one in order to meet everybody else's obligation. Perfect, great, thank you. Um, Mr. Hurd. Pass. <laughs> okay, any other uh, discussion with the four before we have the public comment? Okay, so at this time I will invite public comment for this, and so if you are on Zoom and wish to comment on this item, please raise your hand in Zoom. Um, and if you're room, well, in the room, raise your hand in the room. Uh, let's do a three minute time limit for comments just to give everyone a chance to participate. And uh, please raise your hand if you would like to participate. Come on up, please. And just uh, introduce yourself to the, uh, and uh, if you're a resident of the town, let us know that. How would you like to, like to say? Three minutes, please. Good evening. Hi, you can hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Anju Joglakar. I live on Winter Street in East Arlington. And today I'm here on behalf of uh, the Arlington chapter of Mothers Out Front, let's displace the t-shirt, um, to express our support for a bold and ambitious increase to the ACE default level. The ACE program has accomplished a lot while maintaining stable and competitive prices. We know that using Arlington's purchasing power 
to negotiate competitive renewable energy prices for all residents is a huge opportunity for system level change. Uh, a higher default rate coupled with discount rates for lower income residents and opportunities to opt up and down uh, provide flexibility for the diversity of Arlington residents, including expanding equitable access to renewable energy. Uh, the town's net zero action plan requires that the ACE default reaches 100% renewable energy by 2030. We feel that 2030 is a bare minimum target date and emission savings achieved now will be worth a lot more than those achieved six years from now, say 2030. We need to move as quickly as possible to shift off fossil fuels. And if we can meet the 100% target sooner, then we should do so. Basically, what we are urging you to do is to meet the 100% target, renewable energy, in the upcoming contract cycle. And it could be by the end of the cycle, which could be 2026 or 2027, but to increase the default level in the upcoming cycle now uh, to either 67% or 70% uh, so that we don't wait till 2030 to reach that level. And the reason we say that is because it's a low hanging fruit uh, for meeting our net zero plan commitments. And also the urgency of the climate emergency uh, seems clearer than ever before as the world experiences climate-related extreme weather and struggles to meet climate targets. And this is something, town of Arlington, we can meet this climate target, we can meet it sooner, then we should do so. So Mother South Front Arlington chapter urges all select board members, all of you, and uh, the town manager to approve as high a default level as possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, now I'll turn to, uh, so we have anyone in Zoom with their hand raised? Okay, let's There's go ahead and bring them in. one person with their hand okay, raised. Okay, great. I'll promote them now. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll bring that person in. Hello. Oh, that's disturbing. <laughs> that looks like a chair. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I can't see myself. Can you see me? Yeah, g uh, give us just a minute to work out a Zoom issue here. There we go. Good evening. Um, hi. Hi, just uh, if you would just introduce yourself, and uh, we have three minutes. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, my name is Noga Hirsch. I'm a senior at Arlington High School. I live off Pleasant Street in Arlington, and I'm also one of the presidents of Arlington High School's um, environmental club called Students Against Violations of the Environment. Um, Save Club, and just as a student in Arlington and as a resident, I wanted to voice my approval of um, raising the highest possible default rate of local renewable energy as much as possible. I think that um, I have me and my, like, as a representative of my club, we have concern about the climate crisis and want to ensure a more renewable future for ongoing generations and increasing the renewable energy content um, of the electricity used by the ACE program and its participants would um, support renewable energy development. So I just wanted to voice my approval. Thank you very much. And thank you for your uh, work with the high school group. Thanks a lot. Okay, anyone in the room else uh, would like to comment? Come on up please, yes, go ahead. Reset my trusty timer. Uh -oh. <laughs> Good thank, evening. Thank you, all of you, Chair, Chairman Helmuth, and, and all the rest of the select board and um, Town Manager Feeney. Um, thank you so much for the, the real thoughtful and welcoming <laughs> approach that you take to this project. Um, and I also want to thank the past board and um, Town Manager Adam Jack Delane for going high for the last period, which has put us in, a, in even a better place. Um, I will, um, oh, I am Amy Slutsky, town 
meeting member um, for a few more days until I have to get elected again, hopefully. Uh, 17 is my precinct. Um, I will admit to you I am not a model earthling, and that is why I have joined Arlington's chapter of Mothers Out Front and why I am asking you to do what I cannot do to put the brakes on how much harmful fuel we continue to use. The crushing reality that it has been our own human integrity, ingenuity that has, I mean ingenuity, that has caused this enormity of harm and destruction to our earth <coughs> continues to confound me. Every day I cycle through thoughts of hopelessness. I resolve to act with urgency and I am frustrated at the weakness of my own response. So I'm giving you guys the, the responsibility and the opportunity to do the great work for all of us um, in finding the best balance to move us forward with clean en energy as boldly as possible at the level that our community can support. Thank you again for all of your work on this and I feel so fortunate to be in this town at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck with your reelection. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any, thank you for Do we have anybody else in Zoom with a hand raised? Seeing no hands raised in Zoom. Okay. Anyone else in the room wish to comment? Oh, I lied. There's one hand raised. <laughs> <laughs> bring in, if you could bring in Ms. Moulton, please. Okay. I think you were telling the truth at the moment. At the moment, it was <laughs> no one. <laughs> she was quite. <laughs> Good evening, Ms. Moulton. You are now able to unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Thank you. I hope you'll forgive me for not turning on my camera. It is, uh, I'm Brucey right. Moulton, uh, Precinct 12, a member of both Sustainable Arlington and Arlington Mothers Out Front, and a longtime supporter of. Arlington Community Electricity and a proud participant in the 100% um, opt-up category. I strongly encourage reaching 100% renewable electricity at the earliest possible opportunity. As Anju has so clearly indicated, the cl climate emergency is urgent. Uh, the need to address it is best met by acting sooner rather than later. Um, and this is a low hanging fruit because what we do, what many of us are able to do on our own is expensive. And this is low cost with a big impact. So I hope you will seriously consider moving to 70% if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moulton. Do we have any, any other additional comments from the room? Okay, anybody else in Zoom? Oh, sure. Yeah, come on up. Just introduce yourself, please. Okay. Hi, I'm Rachel Oliveri. Um, I live in Precinct 10 in Arlington. Um, I am also the school sustainability coordinator for the Arlington Public Schools. And um, I just want to raise the voices of the youth that I work with. Um, I believe hopefully you all received the postcards that we collected from our green teams at Gibbs and Audison. Um, these are students that I get to meet with every week and they are so inspiring. And I also work with the wonderful high school students like Greta and Noga, who you heard from tonight. Um, and. Uh, I just can say that from all my time listening to them and hearing how they're feeling about the climate crisis and their very real concerns about their future, um, I, I hope you will take that all into consideration and um, approve of this highest default race, uh, rate for um, Arlington Community Electricity. So I appreciate that so much and thank you. Thank you, and we deeply appreciate the work that you do in the schools. I hear so many wonderful things about the program, and the the way that you're inspiring the students is so evident. Um, I, I got this tonight, you know, and I, you know, I just I, I've heard, I think we I've counted at least 50 communications from residents about this issue, and that might be the record for my three years on the board of how of how much I've heard from people on a given agenda item. Um, in addition to that, we have Cato and Shane 
and Isaac and Oliver and Jonah and Iris. Um, so that's, that's pushing 60 at this point of, of people. And it makes me really proud of the community for how much everybody from middle school uh, onward uh, up to maybe uh, a lot older than that deeply care about this and really want Arlington to be a leader. And I know that the folks like you and your green team are a big part of that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other public comment? Okay, seeing no, let's close the co public comment period. I'll now turn to the board for further discussion, questions, and motions. Mr. Diggins. Well, it'll probably come as no surprise <laughs> that I'm going to make a motion be that we get to 100% you know, um, in this next contract I mean, as soon as possible. I mean, just the fact that I mean, at 70%, there could be even a reduction by $9 I mean, is compelling to me. But the most compelling argument is that, and this was an, an argument that was compelling to me last time, was that the good that we do now is compounded. You know, uh, and so if we, the longer we wait, I mean, the less effective any good we do um, um, will be, you know, um, and so, so it, we can slow down the rate at which we're doing damage if we do more now. And, and, and so it, it, I, I don't want to bring emotion into this because I prefer that we make um, dispassionate uh, decisions you know, based on, on the facts and the evidence and the reasoning, you know, but you know, it, is, it is urgent you know, and it is a crisis and it would be good you know, for us to say you know, that and show that we're doing all that we can, you know, to to meet you know, this moment, you know, and so, so um, that's my motion. You know, but as I've said to everyone, I will I will go as high <laughs> as we can go. You know, so that's it. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Just so to be clear, there was a motion. Yeah. Okay. I'll second the motion, um, and then I think we have to discuss the secondary default rate too, which. Oh yeah. I'm guessing that one should have some pretty easy consensus that we'll get, like I would suggest that we have the default rate, the 100% rate, and the opt-out rate, as opposed to a rate in between. Just the two? Yeah, which is correct. That, that's what is being requ requested, right? Just to have the three levels? Correct. As opposed to the four right now. So I don't know if you want to add that to your motion, or I'll make a, a separate motion to have just three. Are you, are you fine with adding that to the motion? I'm fine Mr. with Chair? that if you are. Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'm happy to support the motion. I think, you know, it's a good time to take advantage of some good rates. I don't want to trivialize any increase to anyone paying any bills in Arlington, um, especially since over the past few years we've asked residents to increase their taxes and whatnot to support, you know, improvements at the local level, but I think there's a pretty clear rationale to be aggressive here. Um, and again, we're taking advantage of anticipated good rates. And at the end of the day, if someone doesn't want to participate, then as Ms. Fox said, at any point, they can choose to opt out of the program. Um, I think the responses of people who have you know, where 90% of the people are just at the default rate is just, you know, most of us have so much going on that we don't even have the minute to go in and change one way or the other. But I think the enthusiasm of the amount of people that have opted, gone in and opted to the 100% shows a clear indication that among residents to be very aggressive with this program. And I think it's been successful. And, you know, I think we can, the quicker we get there, the better, um, and if we put ourselves in a position right now to be aggressive in the event that in the next contract rates aren't as favorable, we can, you know, be a little more conservative w with any increases that we in contemplate at that time. Thank you, and um, I will get to the rest of the board, but just while we're kind of re refining uh, and honing our motion, did, do we want to include something that would be guidance about what to do with the with the 100% rate? Um, I think that the staff have suggested that we consider making that fluid, um, you know, so that that the, the, the default product is is 
a net 100% and sort of not the you know extra like right now if we did that it'd be 124%. Yes, yes. I mean, that's, so, that's so, so so the maximum would be I mean 100% and the, sort of the real yes the real 100%. Yeah. Right. I mean, so we blend we blend. I mean, as the as the state rate changes, I mean, um, three percent a year, we just decrease. I mean, I mean, our renewables. But so that's very simple. That it's a hundred percent. Because I st I still don't quite understand how you have a mix that's higher than a hundred percent. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and is that, that's okay with you for the second on that, if that's the intent of the motion? Yeah. So, in I admit I'm not the most knowledgeable person in this area, and I rely on experts but so the hundred percent so we'll still have a hundred percent an opt up to a hundred percent option right and that would be 124 percent right now so anyone that's oh. that's enrolled so let's, let's in bring our experts back and I think they can and then provide some insight into that yeah oh. it would require some remarketing yeah, yeah uh, go, so, go ahead yeah, go ahead whichever you feel I'll, I'll start I guess yeah. Ryan Katowski yeah. um, so the current 100% product is the mandate plus 100. So it's Correct. actually at 124% currently. If, what I, if, from what I heard from the conversation you're discussing, the default product, which is currently plus 30%, to be maintained at 100% over time. So as the state requirement ramps up, the voluntary additions will ramp down so that it maintains itself at 100%. So that's the difference. So the if you were to maintain the current opt-up product as is, by 2027, it will be 130 percent, 33 percent. If that were the default, if that uh, if, no, that's no, the no, if you maintain the opt-up, yeah, if you maintain the opt-up as a plus 100 percent okay, product, yeah, it's, right, always gonna be, yeah. it's always going to be it's always going to be over and above <laughs> yeah. um, the state requirement. And I I wasn't sure if I heard any discussion of eliminating. The fifty percent product. I think I think Mr. Hurd okay. clarified yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So, so I guess what I'm saying is we would say, all right, our deep you have opt out, got rid of the the fifty percent, so we'll go up to seventy percent, or I mean we can float it so it gets so we say all right we just want it to be a hundred percent always, or we could say can we say it's seventy percent and then as the state adds. Our default product actually gets beyond the hundred percent, which to me is fine. And then there is still an opt up to a hundred percent, which will go from one twenty four to one twenty seven to one thirty. So that's how I I mean, I assume that's what is being requested because we still want people to have this option to go to a hundred percent and be at one twenty four, one twenty seven. We want the default to be higher, well, then the opt out is obviously yeah. always going to be whatever. The and it's an opt. Just to be clear, it's an opt down. Opt so down. it's not yeah. opting out of the out of the ACE program altogether, but it's opting down to a product that just meets the state requirement. Right. But that's correct as to what you. That would sounds correct, and that yeah. and that that opt down product is always going to be available. Mr. Diggins? Sure. So now we're in territory where I need to understand the what is meant by the over 108% because if I mean, I, I'm happy to vote for that but now I feel that I need to understand if I'm going to explain it uh, to people. I mean, so, so I, mean, I, will, I will do my best. Yes. So it doesn't change the amount of electricity that you buy obviously that is, that is the electrons flowing through the wires but associated with each electron we purchase a certificate that is related to clean generation that is somewhere out on the grid. So you can buy as many of those certificates as you want separate from the physical electricity that you consume. So that's the, currently the 100% opt-up product is doing just that. It is buying more attributes which are associated with the certificate than the actual electricity those customers are using. And yeah. you could, you could, I could go and Outside of this program, I could go find somebody to sell me even more certificates if I wanted. There's nothing to stop me from buying as many certificates as I want. And what's the benefit? What's, what's, what's the benefit? The benefit is it creates additional demand. So there's this class one yeah. set of technologies that qualify the wind, the solar, the anaerobic digestion. There's also 
There are also locational requirements, so it has to be power that is produced within New England or delivered to New England from outside. So you actually have to, there's a geographic component and there's also a temporal component. It has to be capacity that was put into operation after the start of the policy, which I think was 1998. So if you had a really old project that predated that date, it wouldn't qualify for the class one. So there's multiple requirements that say this is a class one renewable energy project, and therefore you can mint uh, class one certificates that then are used to meet the statutory obligations and also to meet the voluntary requirements that we have. I still, uh, so, so increase the demand, does that mean that it gives incentive to increase supply? Absolutely, because there's the only place you can get uh -huh. class one recs are from these qualifying projects. So as we increase the demand over and above what the state requires, there's only one place for it to come from over time, which is from new projects. Still so it increases the incentive to create the supply more quickly than it increases demand that could increase the price? So because if we increase the demand you know, without increasing the supply, do we also take the risk of increasing the price because of <laughs> So there are dynamics in the market. This is, there is a, there is a fixed amount of clean energy that, and as you increase that demand for it, you have to come up with new projects and um, I can't predict, you know, where that's gonna go. Uh -huh. um, you know, the, the pricing for the certificates for this round are s just slightly higher than they were in the, than they are in the current contract. So it's not like there's a huge, um, it's m my understanding, not a huge sort of dislocation between supply and demand currently. Uh -huh. All right, well, thanks. Well, Mr. Hurd, you make an excellent <laughs> poker player because you, you, you raised me. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm staying in. Though, so. This is the conversation me and Talia <laughs> had last week. I'm done, Mr. Chair. Oh, Mr. Corsi. We'll have a workshop for the select board on yeah, uh, I, I see what energy recs. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I just want to say, as we've, we've talked about the, the, the history of the community aggregation, and I think we're all, I'm very proud of what this board and what the community has done since 2017, the, fir the first meeting I um, participated in where we gave guidance at that time to Adam Chapdelaine, we were, in, we increased the renewable rate by 11% and we hemmed and hawed and at that point the RPS, the state rate was in the teens and at that point there was a concern that we should have that 50% rate because we, the default rate is, is low, some people may be concerned about going to 100%, we want to maintain three different levels. And, and you see where we've gone in 2022, and it looks like where we're going now for 24. I certainly support getting up to 100% during this contract. Um, I, th I think just going back to the early discussion and Mr. Diggins' questions, um, I think just being candid with everybody, I don't think a lot of people realize that 100% five years ago was 100% plus. In fact, one of my former colleagues who supported it talked to me three months after and said, Steve, I didn't realize I was paying for 116%, but that's why I did it. So I, I think if that becomes the opt-up, okay, and, and we go to this mathematical equation to get to 100 in terms of guidance, I think you've got to make it very clear to people that if you opt to do this, you're doing it perhaps to, to create more demand but you're going over 100%. Just to be absolutely clear, because as the state default rate has gone up, that gap between 100% and what you're really paying for has, you could argue, has become material for, for, for people. Just, so just in terms of being exactly clear what you're doing. If people want to do it, great, but I, I, think, I think we've got to be really, really clear about it. I, another thing I would say is going back to 2019, there was a real concern is, okay, if we're too aggressive with this default rate, are we gonna lose subscribers and people will just opt down to the basic? It looks like, and based on even the studies you've done in terms of if we increase things comparing to the current default rate, there may even be a savings or, or marginal increase depending on what happens. But I don't think that fear of, of losing customers is anywhere near what it was because that's, that's our, our worst case, right? The, we get too aggressive with what the rate is and people opt down to the basic and then you're back to 24 and 27% for a lot of customers. And that's, that's the part where we've always said as guidance 
to the town manager, this is what we'd like to see. But if you get, go through this process and you know, maybe some of the bids come in or, or the parameters are, the expenses are gonna go up, you've gotta balance that a little bit because you, you wanna maintain people who are participating in this and, and hopefully increase it right beyond the 73% that's already there. So I support um, what Mr. Hurd has, has proposed here with, with, again, the guidance that we make it absolutely clear what, what this, what 100% really is going forward. This is where I'll say I agree with you 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. How about 124%? <laughs> that doesn't sound like enough. Just 100%? Really? <laughs> so, so just to be clear sort of what, what's on the table for our, I think our guidance is shaping up. I know we need to hear from Mrs. Mahan too, but we've got, uh, we seem to have consensus so far, of those members who have spoken, of, of a default rate of being 100% is a default, you know, and, and then perhaps an, an opt-up rate if it's clearly marketed to sort of bonus or extra credit. But the default rate would really be sort of the true and dynamically adjusting 100%. Okay. In, in, Mr. Chairman, yeah. I mean, essentially what that would be this year is 76% plus the 24. Correct. To get to 100. Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, Ms. Mahan, did you have anything? Uh, I guess the benefit of going in yeah. last yeah. near the end, just about everything I've wanted to say has been said, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to repeat that. And I, I'm totally cognizant, aware of the fact that it ultimately, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it will be the town manager and Ms. Fox. Will it be next week on a phone call? I mean, what's the next? Right now, we're giving, you're getting a sense of the board, sense of the community um, for the town manager, uh, I believe, along with Ms. Fox, to uh, hear the bids, hear what the contract could be. Does that process happen next week? Is it a phone call? Um, I'm certainly, uh, and whatever we do moving forward, if you call it the 100 plus club and then explain what the plus <laughs> is, it's a state renewable, 24, 27, 30, whatever. Um, but just in terms of um, this board's making a recommendation, I know the manager and Ms. Fox and others have been certainly hearing a pretty unified uh, message. Uh, including from um, our high school seniors, which I'm very excited about, and Audison Middle School. But so, am I correct what the next step is, if I could, Mr. Chair? Of course. Yeah. Mr. Bean? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mahan. And Talia, correct me if I'm wrong on the exact date. It's approximately two, two weeks away. So it wouldn't be next week, it would be the following week but that we'd be receiving. It was the, the following week. We pushed it back so. a little bit. So you're, yeah. not, you're not wrong. Yeah. So yeah, the, the date recently changed, but it's approximately two weeks away where we'd be receiving those bids and having to make that decision. And, and typically we will, if I may, we, yeah, of course. Uh, the day before, so the, the bid day, I believe, is set for uh, early April at this point, and the day before we'll typically do a pre-bid where we'll get some preliminary pricing information from the consultants, through, from suppliers by the consultant. Um, so we'll have an opportunity to sort of take these considerations and, and look at the, the real-time pricing or projections uh, for that pricing. So we'll have a little heads up. And, the, and then the other thing moving forward, which is what the town is already doing um, with the people that we have here in the room tonight with um, Ms. Marzilli, who's our, I think, civic engagement. I'm gonna get her title wrong. But um, on the other end, in terms of education as well as for those um, who may feel this somehow disenfranchises them. I feel very confident and, and just want to add my support also to um, our town employees, uh, department heads and others in terms of whether it's um, your utility bills, electricity, or anything else that um, a lot of times I found that the, the first biggest step is education in terms of what something is and then what something costs and what how that affects you and um, I have seen the three pieces in place for that and I want that to continue so for those where it is something that even once they get the education and, and get to the second but then get to the third step that the town certainly has and will continue to um, work with all of our residents owners renters or otherwise um, to make sure um, we can keep everybody in the community educated as well as um, able to be 
sustainable and <laughs> sustained in Arlington. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm really very, very proud of that because I can tell you someone sort of coming from that roots, one of the best things I think that th this town does now, I won't say when I was a, a young child um, in those circumstances, is um, educating and helping out residents wherever they are in life and just doing it to get done versus um, turning it into a sort of, of a campaign. I know when you're in that position, the last thing you want to hear is, oh, I was able to help Mrs. Mahan because she wasn't able to afford this or didn't understand that. No, do the education, get it done, and it just happens, and that's what's been doing. So please, I know you'll continue on doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry I didn't mention this earlier. Again, this is in the form of guidance to the town manager. One of the things we did previously is basically say circumstances may change that, and, and you may find yourself in a different environment, but there's a floor, like you know, under no circumstances, we don't want to see you go below a certain level. And I, I would say, for me, that's 60% for, like you know where we'd like to be, which is 76 plus 24, but if, if things change, I, I'd suggest a floor of 60%. Um, if, so you have parameters, again, as a, maybe as a, a worst case, if that's acceptable to other members. And then the final thing I'd, I'd like to acknowledge is all the letters that we received from the public. The chair mentioned that earlier. I believe Mrs. Mahan did either. But uh, we read everything that's sent to us. We may not respond to everything, but I want to acknowledge everything that, that came in. I got it from neighbors. I got it from town meeting members, students, residents. So um, we really appreciate that input from the public. Um, is the addition of the recommended floor acceptable? Um, yes. Is it yes. Is it is it is it yes, it is. It's higher than I thought we would set it, so I'm happy with that. Yeah, uh, um, I'll just briefly chime in. I think it will come as no surprise that I'm uh, very, very happy to support all of this. I'm very proud of my town right now, as always, for caring this much about it and being willing to, to clearly make a little bit of an extra investment. I think you know, the worst case scenario of these projections uh, if, if we go with the 70% rate in the coming year would be, you know, a little less than $4 a month on an average utility bill. And I'm really confident that, that the vast majority of the people participating in the program would happily uh, bear that extra cost. And it may end up being in that reduction of $9. Um, and, you know, I would personally suggest to the town manager that I think it is wise to include in our guidance the, uh, a, a contingency of a, a somewhat lower, modestly lower floor. Uh, personally, I would recommend only doing that if, if our assumptions about what we know to expect now about the electricity rates, if those were to tank or to go, to go wrong. Um, I think that's where I would feel comfortable with you doing that, um, but would hope otherwise that, or there'd be other, you know, other major changes um, in the conditions. But otherwise, I think, you know, I sense a lot of community support and support in this body for, for being as aggressive as we possibly can. Okay, any other discussion before we vote? Any other comments from Mr. Reini? Uh No, uh, the, the board's recommendations and guidelines are clear, and I do appreciate Mr. DeCourcy uh, advancing the concept of a floor. You know, I mentioned that in the opening. I think that was the one helpful caveat that, you know, now knowing the board's general direction is also a firm figure to have, recognizing that in, in a way it could be said we're spending other people's money. So if the assumptions we're basing that decision on do not hold true in things you know, very wildly on bid day. It's good to know exactly what the, uh, what sort of the, the baseline is. So I appreciate that. Great. Well, we'll see how long we can hold our breath. Maybe we're two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. Yeah. Okay. So on a motion for the board's guidance is articulated and refined by Mr. Diggins and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Is unanimous five nothing vote. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So now bring us to, and we can unshare the Zoom. Thanks very much. Bring us to warrant article hearings. So we have um, articles to review, so we'll take these individually. Each of those will be a presentation by a proponent. It could be a town staff member, it could be a um, registered voter. And we'll have uh, board questions, opportunity for public comment. And, um, and then final board discussion and motions at that time. Um, so let's start with Article 6, Bylaw Amendment, Vacant Storefront Maintenance Registry. Ms. Lozada, if you please introduce yourself. 
Yes, hi, my name is Katie Lusai. For the record, I'm the Economic Development Coordinator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, select board members for having me this evening. Um, so what I'm proposing under Warrant Article 6 is a few clarifications to the existing vacant storefronts uh, bylaw. So to provide a, a little bit of background here this evening, so this bylaw uh, was passed in about 2016 and was um, brought to life in 2017 by my predecessor, Ms. Carter. Um, as you are all familiar with, uh, there is a $400 annual uh, registration fee for vacant storefronts. So the vacant storefront bylaw is applicable to any non-residential, commercial, or industrial space in Arlington. So this includes re uh, commercial, industrial, medical, office spaces in Arlington. Uh, this does not simply include any storefront, which is why I am bringing uh, some clarity to the bylaw. Um, these fees can be waived for property owners uh, who either demonstrate fiscal hardship or who currently choose to display public art or otherwise activate their storefronts. This bylaw was put on pause during the COVID-19 pandemic and was resumed in December 2023 under my tenure. Uh, for a bit of context, I began this position in late August of 2023, um, and me and my director, Ms. Ricker, decided to start the 90-day vacancy window um, at, in September of 2023 to allow everyone a grace period and to start fresh. So I started to send letters and enforce the bylaw in December of 2023. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to date, the impact of the bylaw, it has greatly imp um, increased uh, greater awareness of a vacant commercial spaces in town. Mm -hmm. People are aware of the bylaw and have engaged with me to talk about the vacant uh, storefronts, and it has given me an opportunity to engage with folks in Arlington about the vacant spaces in town. It's ultimately allowed me to cultivate relationships with different property owners, which has been of an incredibly beneficial outcome of the bylaw. I otherwise would not have, would not have had an opportunity to approach different property owners, um, and it has really allowed me to have more of a, a, a casual, approachable relationship with property owners who may have previously had more of a, um, you know, a, maybe hostile relationship with towns or maybe simply just have related through bills or paper or have not had that personal connection. It's ultimately a tool for intervention, as I've previously mentioned. It's also increased public discourse around uh, brown vacant storefronts in other communities such as Cambridge. And since 2018, it has generated about $9,000 in revenue, though ultimately this is intended to cover um, costs affiliated with Inspectional Services Division. So the first amendment that I am proposing is to uh, clarify the intention of the bylaw. Um, first, this includes changing the bylaw title to Main Street Storefronts. So I will be changing it to, and I'm reading it off of uh, the slide purely because I am nervous about the legal definition aspect of it. Uh, Main Street Storefront as any unoccupied um, non-residential, commercial, or industrial real property ground floor units with frontage along either Massachusetts Avenue or Broadway. So currently we have a lot of vacant properties that are not necessarily along Mass Ave or Broadway. And I believe the intention of the bylaw is to really target those high footage, high trafficked areas, I apologize, <laughs> to those high trafficked areas of commercial spaces. Second, please. Here are a few examples of some of the spaces um, which technically the bylaw um, qualifies and uh, that I am technically supposed, supposed to enforce. Oh, could you please move past this? Thank you. Next slide, please. The second is removing the public art waiver. 
So after discussion with the Arlington Commission for Arts and Culture, I've decided to uh, propose to remove the public art waiver. So the public art waiver is an option for those property owners who do not want to pay the vacant storefront fee. However, though well-intentioned, it is not necessarily well-executed. The public art that property owners choose to display is ultimately up to them and their discretion. It is not curated by any public art expert. And no, uh, the ACAC, the Arlington Commission for Public Arts, does not want the responsibility of managing that public art curation. Um, there are no fees or um, uh, budgets that they want to associate themselves with curating this public art. Um, and they discussed it as um, feeling like it takes advantage of the artistic community um, as an op un unpaid opportunity to uh, display public art, but it still requires work on their part. Next slide, please. Oh, I apologize. This is an outdated presentation. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Are there any questions about uh, the vacant storefront bylaw amendments? Okay, so thank you very much. So that concludes your presentation. So uh, great, uh, I will first, so the chair at this point will facilitate the discussion. Um, and I'll first turn to the town manager. Uh, I know that uh, we appreciate Ms. Luzai's initiative, but I'm cognizant of the fact that the request was made, uh, for this article by the town manager and the director of planning and community development. So if you'd care to speak to um, your degree of support for the recommendations and any other comments that you wish to make as, as the requesting body. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. And in being the requesting body, I will note that I supported this uh, effort as initially described by uh, Ms. Claire Ricker, but uh, I guess on behalf of Ms. Luzai, to essentially take what we have learned from our experience with the bylaw as we've you know, lived with it for a few years and potentially try to correct for some of those things that perhaps we were not entirely cognizant of uh, at the time we passed the bylaw. And I will say that, especially with respect to perhaps some second floor office space in a, a building that someone may not even recognize is currently classified as a commercial vacant storefront. So I think that there were, uh, certainly some instances that made clear we had to pursue uh, some changes here. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, and thank you. Um, so at this point, I'll turn to the board for Sorry. initial discussion. Mr. Hurd? Something was just funny about Jim referring to himself as the requesting body. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wasn't laughing at anyone. I, I, think, I think I may have started that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take it. That's right. I'll second it. Mr. Dickens? Yeah. Oh, no. What's that? I'll second approval. Or, or, oh, did we have, a, we have an emotion and approval? Okay. Move positive action. Sorry, yeah, we're, positive. we're in article hearing. Okay, right. uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and we will have public comment on this, but let me just get this down. Did you have additional uh, comments, Mr. Dickens, on your side? <laughs> oh, well, I might, but I see Mr. DeCourcy's hand up. So, so, no, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Oh, thank Dickinson, you, Mr. Please. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sally, for the um, for the presentation. I just want to clarify yeah. the presentation that we had in our agenda packets also had a proposed amendment on removing old signage. Correct. I just want to confirm that is no longer Correct. a proposal. Okay. Yes, yes. Right, after after advising with town council and attorney Munson, who is our, our new deputy town council, um, we have removed the explicit note um, in my proposed amendment to remove old signage as it is already existing um, under the zoning code uh, for regular building code maintenance. Okay, all right, actually I'm, I'm glad to see yes. that it was removed. So, yes, thank and, you for asking. Sure, and, and just in the markup, um, and again when we get to a, a vote, Main Street storefront is defined as an unoccupied uh, commercial or industrial rural property ground floor unit. Later in the proposed bylaw, there's discussion about a vacant Main Street storefront. So it seems, I, I think, and we can talk with uh, Attorney Cunningham and Attorney Munson, but I think, I think unoccupied probably should come out of the definition of Main Street storefront. Um, and, and we could talk about that on, on, on final votes. But if I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I think 
you know, the bylaw, even without the bylaw, people notice vacant storefronts. And, and, and that's one thing that, as, as a member of the board, just this weekend, a, a Foster Street resident came up to me and said, I'm sure you hear a lot about this, but what's going on with, with various vacant storefronts? And the one that comes up the most is Tango, which um, in June of 2020, uh, Tango left, and that space is, is still vacant. And, and I know this registry... Um, one of the things we may want to think about, and I, I want to ask maybe in your experience, is it, uh, upon the initial registration, the owner uh, is, is to tell the planning department what efforts they're making to relet the space. But then there's an annual registration fee requirement. It doesn't seem like as part of that annual registration there's any requirement to continue to say what's happening. Because I, I think at a certain point, and we all understand that there are challenges in the economy, there's challenges with retail, um, but when four years goes by, and I'm just using that as an example because it comes up in, an awful lot, and, and maybe there's other properties as well, um, if there's not much happening, I, I almost start thinking, do we start thinking about powers under Chapter 121B, urban renewal, and, and, and looking into that as a, as a community? because. I just think it's a it's a long time, and that's an extreme situation. But it's a it's a situation that's troublesome, um, and and other sites. You know, we we heard about the 232 Mass Ave. Now that's a a family that is trying to make a go of that property. They had issues with the the uh, package store that wants to go in there, but they've made an effort. They're they're out there. I don't hear much about these other lo this other location in in, in particular, and, and I wonder if you feel that that would be helpful to have additional requirements, or maybe the town manager too or can come back to us on this, upon registration, is there a further obligation for the owner to let the town know what they're doing? Yeah, it, maybe I'll use this as an opportunity to reset. <laughs> so the, the, the vacant storefront registration program is really that opportunity for me to engage with those property owners. You mentioned Tango, you mentioned 232, Mass Ave. Sending these letters and engaging with those property owners is my opportunity to have those conversations with them. There's a lot of discretion under this bylaw for me to make those determinations with Director Ricker and you know, determine if these property owners are making a bona fide effort to lease their spaces. There is, when property owners pay the vacant storefront fee, when they simply give me a check, there's a benefit and there's a challenge. They send me a check, which is in one way, great, they're doing their part by sending the fee. In another way, there is a challenge because I'm not capturing that information. So that's why the bylaw really is great in creating those relationships because there are those property owners in town like 232 Mass Ave, where I'm able to have those conversations and talk through, oh, you're having difficulties with the package store? Let's talk through it. Oh, great, you signed a lease? That's fantastic. All right, I, I'm, I'm seeing the steps. We're, we're having those conversations. I, there's a little bit more discretion to it. it uh, if, it's, if they're not coming in in six months, is, is there anything that we can do to activate that storefront? So there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a little bit more leeway, and I'm, I'm more flexible with the bylaw than what it is on paper. So as long as property owners are showing a bona fide effort to lease their spaces, then I'm, I'm great on, on my part. There's a lot of great property owners in town, but like, like spaces like Tango, there's a lot of property owners who, um, you know, aren't, aren't necessarily as, as considerate to the neighboring businesses and all the really wonderful active property owners in town. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Uh, before we turn to the public, any uh, uh, additional, okay. So uh, this point, we'll, we'll entertain public comment on this Warren article. And if you are in Zoom and wish to comment on this article, please raise your hand in Zoom. Same thing if you're in the room. Are we okay with our Zoom connection now, Ms. Mar? Yeah, <laughs> seeing no hands raised at this time. All right. Anybody in the room? Okay, that concludes your public comment. Any, uh, we are already have motions and a second, so uh, any uh, additional comments or questions for the board? Just a quick question, Mr. DeCourcy, I, I could ask you offline. That was chapter 121A? B. B, okay, thank you. Let's take a note, look it up later on, thank you. 
Uh, I will. Uh, I'll just add that I appreciate the the, the discussion that Mr. DeGorsi uh, initiated with Mr. Uh, with Ms. Lusai. I think I'm I'm glad to know that your thoughtfulness and creativity, um, and in addressing the circumstances. I think, like Mr. DeGorsi, I also hear quite a bit from residents about you know what's the town doing, and you know when I get done explaining that with our strict limits of the law to what we can compel uh, property owners to do. It's really helpful to be able to point to this discussion to, to say that we are really doing everything that we can and that this bylaw is a tool. I'm glad that you are applying it uh, flexibly, but more importantly, glad that you are doing the really hard work of, of um, looking at things case by case, establishing relationships with the property owners, because we know from past experience that's really the path to success here. So I want to express my appreciation for all that unseen work behind the scenes and giving us the ability to be able to as board members explain to the public that it's part of the good work that's going on. Thank you, um, and if I may, I do also I, I do also want to note that this bylaw is an example for, for other communities in town. I, you know, not only Cambridge has initiated their own vacant storefront bylaws, the state has as well, um, but other communities like Belmont and Lexington most recently have contacted me to, to try and initiate their own bylaws. So. This, like in, in 2017, we're talking about local bylaws that have made a big difference. This, this one has as well, and it really serves as a role model for the greater community. Fantastic. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so on a motion for, what was it, favorable action? Is that the term we, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed is unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Let's now turn to Article 8. Bylaw Amendment Annual Town Town Meeting Start Date, and I'll notice that we have um, three town meeting related uh, articles, but we will take them up one at a time. We are privileged to have, by the way, in the room with us tonight, the moderator, and I expect that, uh, that he will want to speak to some or all of these at some point. Um, so the first one, start date, is this, and is this the one that's, the, is this the uh, Town Meeting Procedures Committee, or, uh, no, turn it going in. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I believe yeah. the, the yeah. first one, Article 8, is by a registered voter, uh, Phil Goff. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, so I believe Mr. Goff is queued up. Um, and uh, good evening, Mr. Goff. Please uh, introduce Hello. yourself and talk to us about your article. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Phil Goff. I'm at 94 Grafton Street in East Arlington, and I am a town meeting member, Precinct 7 for the last 10 or so years. I'm happy to be here with the first time that I've actually offered a warrant article. It's a pretty simple one. <laughs> um, and the, the one thing actually, I'll, I'll probably need some clarification on. The, um, the warrant article that I wrote up, it had a part A and a part B. Are we discussing both? Because it's my understanding that the part B uh, might be moot, the part B that related to the whole fourth Monday of the month in April, should we talk about both, or is yeah, that I, one now? I, yeah, I think I think it, um, I think you should talk about both since this was the the uh, components of your warrant article, and I think it'll be up to to us to sort of sort out any duplication that there may be with, with the different warrant articles. Uh, but, okay. But yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, and obviously there's duplication with my yeah, point uh, part A as well. So um, as I have no presentation. I'll just sort of speak to this. It'll be very brief. It's not very complex, of course. Um, as many of you, or perhaps all of you may recall, it was probably five or five years ago or so at town meeting, uh, there was a warrant article to uh, change the town meeting start time, um, move it from eight o'clock to 7 p.m. and end at 10 p.m. And um, that was rejected, I think, relatively comfortably. Um, there were many concerns that it, it just was a little too early and a number of people just simply couldn't make it, uh, especially parents with young children, and that was understandable. Um, you know, since the since then, the eight o'clock start time for me personally, I guess hasn't been too much of an issue, but on occasion when I try to um, recruit people to run for open seats in town meeting, what I do hear quite a bit from people, there's a whole range of, of opinions people have about potentially joining town meeting. But one thing I have heard a number of times is People, you know, they're accustomed to going to bed at 10 or 1030 and they know that going to town meeting or being part of town meeting means, you know, twice a week going to bed, usually at 1130 or so. So I thought uh, it's probably not unreasonable to think about um, a 730 to 1030 runtime 
uh, for town meeting, which provides sort of a nice compromise in some ways between seven, which was too early for some people for sure, and eight o'clock start time, which um, I feel is a little late, and I think many others do as well. So that's really kind of the core of um, uh, of this Warren article, as as uh, two other town meeting members who will speak to theirs as well soon after mine, um, and I'm hoping for support from the select board on that. Good, thank you very much, uh, Attorney Cunningham. So, how, tell can you give me some guidance about you know these are separate. Warren articles, but there's the you know, obvious overlap with respect um, to well to, to two components in a couple of cases. Um, do we should we just you know have discussion and clarification and votes sequentially, or or try to combine some of the presentation and discussion um, as we go along here? I would recommend that the board take these matters up individually, but then perhaps uh, take a final vote on on a collective because they are so interrelated. Uh, you know, the issue of discretion regarding the start date of town meeting and then the time, depending on where the select board lands. I think that essentially this, the board would be well, well advised to rec recommend some sort of action, favorable action, if, if so inclined, on one particular course rather than doing three separate, but they are separate hearings. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I think um, uh, my principal concern here is I want to make sure we avail ourselves of the insights of the moderator, including on this discussion of this, just because um, he leads the town meeting procedures committee, which has weighed in on uh, at least one of these issues and also has uh, may have information uh, for the board and, and recommendations just based on his own experience as, as the person in charge of town meeting. So how would you suggest we, we kind of uh, d integrate that into this discussion? I think the... Thank you, Mr. Chair. The best way to proceed would be for the board to c conduct a hearing on each individual Warren article, uh, perhaps at the end of each hearing a table uh, discussion, mm -hmm. and then at the end of the third and final uh, Warren article relating to this matter, going to take one collective uh, action that relates to all three. Yeah. Does that sound generally all right to my comments, comments and procedure from my colleagues? At town meeting, aren't they going to have to vote on all these individually? They will, but it's going to be, they'll have the reference in the select board report that this is essentially whatever the preference might be from the board, uh, whether there's a, a preference to change the start date, to provide discretion, do neither. At that point, they'll be best able to deal with um, each individual warrant article and vote on them individually, but at least they'll have one collective thought from the board that will be, I think, more clear to town meeting than it would be to provide three separate thoughts. You could just write one thought and just put ditto. ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I think we've got public comment in the last one. I don't know if anybody wanted to talk about About the uh, storefront? No, uh, the chair did call for public comment. Oh, yes, okay. did, did I do it? Yes, oh, yes, she did. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm glad someone's sorry. Keep, I keep doubt you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Mr. Hurt. Gotta pay attention. Yes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, um, uh, Mr. Diggins. I was just. I mean, I look at my reference material. I mean, I'm not seeing anything for, for eight. I mean, did everyone else get? You know, I think I didn't. I think that might have been omitted from our packets. All right. All right. Uh, inadvertently as well. That's fine. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> you, you want me to read the actual language that was in my no, no, Warren article that was signed? Give us, give us just a second, Mr. Attorney Cunningham. We do have um, is Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Diggins, in my memorandum, there is yeah. uh, a discussion of Article 8 as well as draft motion, motion language that I believe is consistent with Mr. Goff's intent. Yeah. Uh, you go uh, to Cunningham memo or town okay. council memo, everything's in there. Uh, thank you. I thought I'd read it, you know. If you have a reading for I guess I just missed it. Okay. Oh, okay. I see it. Yeah, I see it now. It's a discussion of. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry, I missed yeah, it. Been... No, you're gonna read that stuff, let like Mr. Um, so, um, yeah. Can, I just yeah, want to clarify. Um, so, so what I'm hearing, and I don't think we've asked, or maybe we've already done it for eight, but after eight public hearing, make a, a motion to table, table right. um, which. I will do right now if you tell me we're at that point with all the different discussions and sidebars. Okay, that's all right. And then when we get to nine, hear everything, yeah. move to table, and then when we get to ten, basically we're going to take them all up because there's such 
Right. Okay. So you, I, I think it's the I think it's our uh, council's advice, Attorney Cunningham. Yes. You're, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know we we certainly have the, the moderator with us tonight, so the the conduct of town meeting and how it approaches these articles is likely to be different. Yeah. They will have to take individual votes on each one in time, um, but I think it'd be that. That's a suggestion for the board. I think it's the best course. It's the most clear course. It's going to provide uh, guidance to town meeting about how uh, the select board is feeling on these three articles, which are so interrelated. Yeah, that's, that sounds fine to me. Okay, let's proceed with that. So, um, so Mr. Goff has made his presentation. Um, so let's have a public hearing now on Article 8 and invite public comment for Article 8. And what we'll do is when that's done, then we'll table that. We'll just move to the Article 9 presentation. So uh, ultimately, I think there'll be there'll be a number of opportunities to comment on the substance of this due to the overlapping nature. But uh, but that said, any public comment now, uh, please raise your hand in the room or in Zoom on Article Eight. <laughs> Mr. Christiana. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Of course. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I uh, apologize I didn't get these uh, published in advance. Uh, I did send them uh, to Ms. Marr uh, online, so she has a digital copy. Uh, and I also have several. Is it appropriate for me to hand these out here? Yeah, yeah you can hand it to Ms. Marr and she can distribute them. They're in, yeah. They're in the system. We have them. I, I, yeah. I updated Novus. Oh, you yeah. updated Novus? OK, so actually, I do need a print copy. Yeah. Woo, these long rums. So, um, sh shall I just go oh, ahead? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, I just want to give a little bit of background. Uh, Greg Christiana, town moderator. Um, uh, we conducted a, uh, a survey of town meeting members in December of 2023. Uh, that survey closed in January of this year, 2024. Uh, and the survey covered a range of topics. Um, and the one that's relevant here to the, the, uh, the warrant here, the article hearing tonight uh, is uh, that there was a question about the uh, town meeting members' preference for start times. Now, to be clear, my intention in asking this question of town meeting members was to get their preferences for a determination that I and other uh, officials would make, such as select board chair, town clerk, uh, town council, and so on, uh, to figure out if we wanted to adjust the start time of town meeting for not the first night, but subsequent nights, because the first night's start time is specified explicitly for 8 p.m. Uh, in the town bylaws. Um, so my intention was just to get a, pre a, a read from town meeting members for a decision that, that we as public officials would make. Um, and uh, what's being discussed here, obviously, is a hearing for uh, amending the town bylaws. Uh, so it's not exactly the same question, uh, but I figured it might be useful to the select board to see the information that I have. I'm in the process of um, uh, analyzing and uh, preparing uh, uh, a summary of survey results to be published. Uh, and so I thought it, it might be helpful to give just the, the small bit of results that I had processed that's relevant to the hearing tonight. Um, and so I've provided these handouts. Um, and basically, there's two questions that might be relevant. One particularly relevant is, uh, was question 13 from the survey, uh, asking town meeting members their preference uh, for three different time ranges. Um, and so as you can see here, uh, most, uh, this is on the, the first page, the front page, um, uh, a, a plurality of town meeting members preferred a start time of 7 p.m., assuming that it would run for three hours till 10 p.m. It was very limited options. Um, uh, and then the next most popular, uh, again, th these are small samples, so we can't read too much into it. And then this is uh, 154 responses to question 13 uh, out of 252 town meeting members. Um, and then the, the least popular option among the three was uh, a start time of 8 p.m. and running to 11 p.m., which is the status quo. Uh, and I took the liberty of uh, cross-referencing that with another question, which you'll see on the reverse side, uh, question 16, just so we could see just uh, how this breaks down across different ranges of town meeting members based on their tenure of service uh, as town meeting members. Um, and so you can see that there, there's some slight correlations here. Again, we can't read too much into the data because these samples are relatively small. Um, but you can see that for town meeting members serving less than five years, uh, the, the most popular preference was for uh, a 7 p.m. start time, 
Um, and then looking at town meeting members at the bottom uh, who are serving for more than 10 years, uh, the most popular preference among that population was to retain the status quo at, at 8 p.m. So you can see like, and that's just one cross section here. Uh, there's lots of other ways the data could be sliced. I didn't have time to provide other uh, uh, cross sections, but hopefully any of this information might be useful uh, for your decision tonight. Thank you yeah. very much indeed. And did you have any comment on the other portion of, of um, this particular article with respect to the date, uh, the starting date? I know that, that you have the timing procedures. Right, so we can cover that well. uh, on when we cover Article yeah, 10, but that's yeah. Fine. Okay. Sure. Thank you, for, uh, thank you very much. Can I just ask one question? Yeah, it is mine, yeah. In, in, am I reading this correctly? I understand it's 154 responses you said in total? Yeah, I mean, there were different numbers who responded to question yeah. 13 versus question 16. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I cross-referenced the ones where they answered both questions. Yeah. So for me to maybe try to figure out how that 154 breaks down, is it on the flip side, second page, that town meeting members less than five years, you had about a little under 60 responses. Is that what that, those numbers mean? And then town meeting members who responded who are serving five to 10 years, it's like 42 people are in that. That's right, it was, a, uh, I, yeah, I, I can get the exact numbers, but it's roughly 55 or so uh, who responded who served less than five years, uh, a little over 40 who served five to 10 years, and about 40 who served uh, more than 10 years, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Okay. Any other public comment on this article or um, Mr. Corsi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Christiana, for, for uh, coming this evening. I just wanted to clarify, we received a, an email from you with potential proposed language for Article 10. It does incorporate the 8 o'clock. Did the town meeting procedures committee talk about 7.30 versus 8 o'clock, or were you just focused on the, the select board pro potentially choosing a, a different start date? Yeah, the, the, the discussions at the town meeting procedures committee prioritized uh, the selection of the start date and how that's specified in the town bylaws and relaxing uh, the, the current kind of hard requirement that, that we start on the fourth Monday in April. Uh, because of the, the conflict this year, obviously, with the first night of, of, of Passover. Uh, so that was the highest priority, and I don't recall if we specifically discussed changes in, in the start time. Okay, thank you. Kind of pass through to sure, thank you. Yeah. And also, the, I'm, I'm still contemplating whether to convene the Town Meeting Procedures Committee to discuss uh, any of these. Obviously, we weighed in on, on the one that we submitted for Article 10, uh, but that's uh, still being decided whether we're going to uh, yeah, convene to discuss the other two articles. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Christian. I appreciate you weighing in. We'll be seeing you soon, I'm sure. Okay. Um, any other public comment on this article? Uh, bef Anything in Zoom? Seeing no hands raised, thank you. Okay, so uh, at this point, I entertain a motion to table uh, the hearing for Article 8. Move to take. Second, Mr. Hurd. So we have a, a motion to table by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so it's a unanimous motion to table the hearing for Article 8. This will now bring us to the hearing for Article 9, Bylaw Amendment, Revised Town Meeting Start Time. And uh, is Ms. Kelleher in the room? Yes. Come on up. Good evening. Please introduce yourself. Hi. Thank you. I'm Krista Kelleher from 153 Medford Street. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 5. I filed Article 9 with the intention of having town meeting begin earlier and end earlier each evening. I'd like to offer the following um, top 10 reasons why town meetings should begin at 7.30. Number 10, late night policy decisions aren't necessarily ideal. Number nine, there might be town meeting members who struggle to stay awake until 11 p.m. Number eight, it's important to respect the time and needs of town employees, board and commission members, ACMI staff, town consultants, legislators, select board members, and others who watch um, and or speak at town meeting, including students. Number seven, an earlier end time might, might allow for increased sleep, making for healthier habits and more rested town meeting members. Number six, the later into the evening the meeting runs, the more likely it is that town meeting members depart before adjournment. Number five, sticking with an 11 p.m. end time 
might deter some residents from being willing to serve our, and run for town meeting as um, the f other proponent, uh, Mr. Goff, um, suggested. Number four, starting earlier might allow town meeting members and others to get to the bake sale even earlier. Number three, February um, 2023 town meeting member survey results indicate that 61% preferred an end time earlier than 8 p.m. I didn't have the most current numbers um, just presented by the town moderator. Number two, town meeting members who have early morning work obligations and or caregiving responsibilities might appreciate having more time to rest. And number one, a modified start time or the top reason why we should change to 7.30 is a modified start time would affirm that traditions can adapt over time in response to changing needs. Um, saying all of that, I'm completely open to withdrawing my article if it's considered duplicative given Article 8, and I'm happy to do that procedurally. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, I'll see if there's any additional public comment on this article. If you'd like to comment, please raise your hand in Zoom or in the room. Right. Seeing no so, hands, I see. right, seeing no hands. So, so I think uh, we're looking in discussion for the board. Yeah. Looking for a motion to table Article Nine. It's a hearing. So moved. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. So we have a, a motion to table the hearing for Article Nine by Mr. DeCourcy and seconded by Mr. Hurd. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimously tabled. All right. Now this brings us to Article 10, Bylaw Amendment Start Time for Annual Town Meeting. And this one is the Town Meeting Procedures Committee, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, yes. so we got Mr. Christiana, the uh, chair of that body. Further go into that half of the issue. Hello again. Hello again. Uh, for the record, um, uh, I make no commitment as moderator about the effect of the start time on the yes, break please. for the uh, uh, for the base cell. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, sorry, let's pull that up. Uh, so yeah, the, the town meeting procedures committee um, uh, requested the inclusion of um, uh, this article in the warrant. Um, felt that. Um, uh, there, there was um, um, uh, there was discussion uh, between myself and the uh, select board chair and others about what to do about the, the, the conflict that we had this year and uh, the main uh, thrust of uh, why we uh, put this article forward uh, was to avoid this, uh, this sort of conflict in the future and to, uh, to give the select board latitude to do this in a way that was clearly specified uh, in the uh, town bylaws. Um, and uh, that's about it. Attorney Cunningham? Yeah, just uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I know we've had this discussion with the board before, but Title I, Article I does give the board discretion when setting the town annual election date. It did not give similar discretion when setting the time for town meeting, which is the fourth Monday in April. And as Mr. Christiana, town moderator, indicated, uh, for the first time since 1967, the fourth Monday in April uh, is the first night of Passover this year. This will occur again in 2035. Um, however, just the, the discretion to avoid any problems uh, is something that this bylaw amendment is, uh, seeks to provide. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I uh, appreciate the, the Town Meeting Procedures <coughs> Committee thinking about this and helping us think, think it through and recommending language because I think that um, you know, I think I suspect there'll be pretty good consensus that we really lock this down, uh, but making sure we do that right is, is worth doing. So thank you very much. Okay, so let's have um, invite public comment on Article 10. If you would like to comment on Article 10 in Zoom, raise your hand or in the room, do the same. Ms. Marr? Seeing no hands raised. Okay. All right, so Attorney Cunningham, do we need a table 10 or do we bring the other two back at this point? I bring the other two back, and I think if there's one motion collectively that addresses what the board is, wants to do on, this, on these issues, 
um, the draft vote and comments would be would reflect essentially all three of them would list the same mm -hmm. draft motion. What if the board's able to come to consensus mm -hmm. on what it wants to do? That draft motion will exist in the in the comments for each of the three okay. Warren articles. All right. So I think I need a motion to bring the other two back, uh, Mr. Hurd. Motion to bring the other two articles back. Okay. That's one question of clarification. Okay. All right. Get you. Um, do I second the motion? Yeah, so we have a, uh, a motion to uh, bring, bring back from the table Articles uh, 8 and 9 to this hearing, and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those they are back in the table. We are now um, open for discussion, questions, and motions from the board for all three. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I, I, so just to make sure, you know, does Article, I mean, um, um, yeah, Article 10, does it specify that Town meeting can't start earlier than any given date. It says no later than the second Monday in May. But does it specify that it can't start any earlier than the fourth Monday in April? We need to get an opinion from Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, it doesn't specify. Okay. okay. So we need to lock that down. And I would say, you know, because because we, I think, I think we do want to specify the earliest it can start. And although I guess we have discretion over the election day, you know, but then I think at that point we want to make sure that we have a certain amount of time between the election day and the first day of town meeting. So that's something we'll need to work out. And I'm going to recommend to uh, the moderator that he does reactivate I mean, the town meeting procedures committee to discuss that and also the ramifications I mean, of changing the start time I mean, to not only 7.30, but also seven o'clock, you know, because it seems like there are people, you know, who are interested in seven o'clock. Because I'll tell you, someone who falls off a cliff at ten o'clock, you know, and he's like kind of getting uh, us done you know, by by um, by ten o'clock would be um, my preference. But once again, I mean, one of the reasons we have hesitated on this, well, well, there are two. One was that the previous town moderator was just adamant about not starting later. And then one of his arguments was that, hey, well, we have these other meetings that happen uh, beforehand sometimes. And so we need to take into account hey, that people may need to meet before town meeting and, and how that affects their schedule. Hey, so I'd like for town, the town meeting procedure committee to take that, I mean, help us understand you know, the interactions hey, so that we can make a decision that is more cognizant of the impacts of changing the start time, be it 7.30 or 7 o'clock. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, yeah, I agree with Mr. Diggins on the Article 10. Um, and, I, and I think when this was discussed, and maybe we can follow up with the Town Meeting Procedures Committee, I, th I think the intent was it would be a, if, if it had to be changed, it yeah. would be a later date. And, and maybe we can uh, talk about that and, 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 and come back, because it would just really be a matter of, uh, unless the select board votes to establish a later date in time, yeah. um, because it is the the end date, no being no later than the second Monday in May is is already there. I mean, um, I don't know if there was there would be a scenario with we're having to start it earlier. It's always going to conflict with the vi the, the vacation the week yeah, before, so probably yeah, right. it would be better um, to be later. I I and I, I just want to throw this out as as far as the start time is concerned. I mean, I think this. Because the first night of town meeting is in our town bylaw, that's that's why it's here before us. But once town meeting starts, it's up to the body to determine when they meet at, at subsequent meetings. I I wonder if if this is something that um, you really want as much town meeting input as possible. And I appreciate Mr. Christiana providing these survey responses, but this could be a matter of us just holding off on our recommendation and, and let's see what happens at town meeting on the first night or second night in terms of what the vote is for the next recess. And if, if, there's, if the will of the town meeting is, yeah, we want to do 7.30, we want to do 7, then we, we're in session throughout town meeting. We can then make that recommendation. Because to be honest, I'm, I'm indifferent. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a late person, so going to 1130 or midnight isn't a problem for me. But I, I totally appreciate what, the, what people are going through. And 730 you know, may be the right time. but. That's a way to get the town meeting vote and, and get our recommendation. And that's really the 252 town meeting members are really who we want to hear from on that. I, I, um, I'll just make a quick 
comment along that regard. I think it's an intriguing suggestion of Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, to thread the, the needle that I've struggled with on this is that although the select board's required to make a recommendation, this is really something town meeting needs to decide for itself. It's town meeting's decision, it always has been. I'm actually really glad that this came back this year. I think it's really healthy that we ask at town meeting this question every few years because as has been pointed out, uh, the, the composition of town meeting you know, has changed. So. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of more with Mr. Diggins. I turn my coach turns into a pumpkin around about 10. Uh, but, but I think the point being that um, I, I, I've been known for quoting uh, Mr. Spock in, in one of the Star Trek movies that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And I think this is a really good argument for, for giving town meeting as much power as it one. can. Or the one. Oh, another, another Trekker. Or the one. <laughs> um, you know, giving town meeting as much of a voice as possible on this. And so, you know, I was, I, I, if we could take a vote, you know, about what we individually think town meeting will want to do, but ultimately if there's a way to do that and let town meeting really take the lead on this, um, <coughs> that, that's really appealing to me. Um, I have some more questions, but I'll yield to Mr. Hurt. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just say, I mean, my comments were kind of following what you're saying, and we've, we have done this in past, Warrant article, warrant articles that affected this board that we essentially passed it along. We moved positive action for the purpose of putting it in front of a town meeting, and in our comments, we actually put the board takes no stance on this warrant article, and one particular article um, stands out for me on that. So I, I mean, I think we could do. I think. I don't think you're going to get consensus because I'm pretty on the opposite end of what we've heard so far. Because I, you know, I'm happy to move it to town meeting for a vote. I would not vote for it because eight, seven thirty, seven just doesn't work for me. So um, eight o'clock is much better. Um, if it's at seven or seven thirty, I'll just be late for a lot of town meetings. But that's just me, and so I, I think you know it's something that has to go to the the members for a vote. So, I mean, I think what we would do is move, I, I think we're all in, on, in agreement on having discretion to not have to have town meeting on religious holidays, but I think as far as the start time, we just push it, the question to town meeting in whatever form that that needs to be condensed with these three articles. And then in the, in the, you know, comments, we just say that the board takes no, no individual the board as a whole doesn't take a position on a time. Attorney Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if the board is inclined, it could take say, three separate votes because um, there's Article 10 doesn't deal with time. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So right. then Articles 8 and 9 could be a certain vote and comment and recommendation from the board, and 10 could be something else. I know you have questions, so oh. when I want oh, you to you. tell me when it's appropriate. I just want to focus on Article 10 and that issue, but I want to... Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair. Yeah, I have a, a question on, on the setting of the time. So the scope of this, of these warrant articles, really seems to be limited to changing the bylaws definition of the first the meeting time, seven of 7.30 or 8 o'clock on the first night of town meeting. Um, and I think, as most town meeting members know, although maybe haven't really thought about, what really happens, and it was alluded to earlier, is that what happens for the subsequent nights of town meeting, that's not controlled by the bylaw, that's actually controlled by tradition. And the tradition is to date that the select board chair makes a sort of a prearranged, pre-printed motion, and it's actually handed to you by the clerk. Uh, to say if we don't finish our meeting tonight, then everybody groans. Then, then you know we will next convene at this date at this time, and that controls meeting a meeting at a time when, when we do this. Um, I think the tradition has been that that pre-printed motion follows the first night of town meeting, just just to kind of respect the intent of that. But that's not actually what the bylaw does. So, um, would it be? Should we consider, and would it be within scope to recommend that town meeting, if town meeting really wants to hew to a certain start time every night, whether that be 7, 7.30, or 8, um, suggesting a further bylaw change that would actually specify the start time for all sessions, 
I don't, you know, I don't know. I guess the first question whether that would be in scope, and that's probably a question for the moderator in a different context. Um, but you know, the Attorney Cunningham might, you know, have an initial opinion on that. I don't know if it's a good idea. I'm just putting that out there. Is this, is this an opportunity um, to kind of fix that ambiguity? At, thank you, Mr. Chair. At this stage, the, the select board has pretty wide discretion and control of the warrant. If it chose to include something like that in a draft motion, it could do so. Okay. Um, you know, this is any any action related there too provides mm -hmm. a lot of discretion for this board to act in a way it seems appropriate. And then the town meeting itself, that body is held to a stricter standard and scope standards yeah. Um, okay, yeah. based on the draft motion language it's facing. Yeah, okay. So okay. I don't, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't know if that's something we want to do, but it has occurred to me before that that's kind of a, of a I wouldn't say it's a loophole, it's just sort of an unspecified um, situation. My other question is other, other, on the other end of this, and that is the implication is a three hour duration of a meeting. We go from 8 to 11. The suggestion by the proponents of these articles is that we would go from 7.30 to 10.30 or perhaps even 7 to 10. But again, that's not controlled in bylaw. That's controlled by, I think, when someone makes a motion to adjourn and the moderator has a lot of discretion in recognizing that motion. Is that your understanding, um, Ms. Uh, moderator? Of, yeah, it's our tradition and custom that we follow. Yeah, tradition custom. So, um, you know, so again, I'm not suggesting that that be codified either, but I'm just kind of pointing out for the, the, the larger discussion of that, that this, the actual scope of the proposed change is really just kind of around the margin and, and the tradition and the custom would, would take over from there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just something to consider um, since we have an opportunity to potentially do some surgery on this. Mrs. Mahan, I'm done. Can the one add one more concern? No, the one, especially since the one knew the full Star Trek quote, which warms my heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I, I know other years when this has been discussed, it, not that this should guide anything, but um, there are three committee, committee and boards, the redevelopment board, the select board, and the finance committee that the way it works right now is every night there's town meeting, those three, fi fin finance committee, redevelopment board, select board, meet at seven, sometimes 6.45 until eight. Um, so the, in years past when this, been dis this has been discussed, um, usually each of those committees, somebody gets up and represents what a, if it went to 7.30 or seven, what a 6.30 or 6 or 5.30 start time would mean. And that's just another consideration. That's not something that should guide it, but that's um, no matter what, some of us are here f four to five hours and that's just how it is. So anyways, but when we get to, <laughs> we can, since we're still on 10, um, I'm still gonna wait for the chair, but I, I, I would like to, when we can, just um, to me 10 is a standalone it, there's some um, overlap with eight on that in terms of um, further defining um, the discretion that this current board and any future select board has regarding setting the first, the commencement of yeah. any annual town meeting. But I'm going to wait until one of you tell me it's time to make that motion. Okay, yeah, I think because it, 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 is, it is separate. Okay. Um, I think that we might want to contemplate since the, rec since the language from the Tommy Procedures Committee does include sort of that carryover of the default 8 p.m. start time, if uh, Attorney County, I mean, do we need to try to fix that in our motion or is that something that, that would be overridden by the order we take this up in town meeting if town meeting votes to change the start time? Uh, I'm just trying to understand it clearly. What what are you suggesting on Article 10? Oh, um, do we in our motion for Article 10? Do we need to do anything with with the sort of the default 8 p.m. start time that was included in there? You know, giving that town meeting town meeting might change that start time under a different article. <laughs> Which one would clobber? The Article other? 10 is just ha has to do with start date. It doesn't talk anything about start time, does it? Yeah, it, and I think thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at this stage, I think it might be best if once the board is done with its discussion to take up each article individually just for clarification at this okay. point. All right, yeah. So what, Article 10 does not deal with the time change. It okay. deals just with the start date. Um, I don't think that the board would necessarily want, need to consider that there. To the extent that the board wants to consider time changes, uh, 8 and 9 provide those opportunities and the <laughs> comments could reflect those desires. Okay, yeah, that's fine. All right, so... Um, 
It does, Mr. Diggins. So it does say, I mean, to see if the town will vote to I mean, a turn to start dates and times. I mean, so. Yeah, that that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, that this was in the scope of 10. You know, and I'll say that, that he, I understand. I mean, in fact, I had the, the same thought as Mr. DeCourcy is that town meeting can change, I mean, the start time. But I think it's really important that we he, discuss the ramifications of that start time. I mean, and, and I think it would be better if we locked it down I mean, because he, for us to not have it known to the committees, the other committees, what time town day, is, I mean, sorry, town meeting is going to start on a subsequent day it just creates a lot of uncertainty. I mean, they can prepare I me mean, for the earliest possible, possible start time, which is fine. I mean, uh, uh, so we're, we are good at doing that. I mean, I think it'd be better uh, if we didn't, you know, if we did lock it down so that people can know when planning, because you know, some of us do plan I me mean, further in advance, I me mean, for when we're going to schedule things, to know that I mean, I'm going to have to be, you know, at the, in Arlington, you know, four o'clock, I mean, uh, or, or, or whatever. I mean, so, so let's try and, and specify as much as we can. I mean, um, and I certainly understand that it's not going to work I mean, for all 252 um, town meeting members. But I also think that we can try to accommodate as much as possible, meaning that you know, if we know that an important vote is going to come up, I mean, like we've had to adapt I mean, our pace in town meeting. I mean, and so if we know that most people aren't going to show up until eight o'clock. I mean, we can do other business between seven and eight, I mean, so that we can capture I me mean, most of the town meeting members that are going to be there. That's totally within the realm of town meeting. I mean, um, so, so if we want to start earlier, we can make it work. You know, if we don't want to. That's fine too. You know, thanks. Mr. Thank you. So, Mr. Diggins, when you say specify a start time, are you talking about a first date? Yes. So not the time because. The time in front of us is 7.30, regardless of the, what the, the survey says, right? So th that's what we'll, Tommy will be voting on, a 7.30 start time, right? Yeah, I'm talking about the first day. Yeah, the first day. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about many interrelated things yes. that sound the yeah. same. Um, yeah, my only comment to Mr. Helmuth's comment about codifying it for each night is I think we... With our problem number two, we have it because of a lack of discretion. So, mm. I mean, I think mm. codifying less is better and mm. giving discretion to the meeting to adjust, whereas there might be, you know, the Arlington hockey teams in the final, or the Arlington baseball teams in the finals and we want to start at 8 o'clock one night or something like that. But just, well, I say no. that facetiously, yeah. but yeah. there could be something that comes up that the town wants to, you know, that a lot of town meeting members would like to, attend and to give the discretion to do so I think is a more favorable path. Just spe speaking in response to that, I actually find that persuasive. So yeah. thank you. Um, so we all three of these are on the, are on, the uh, on the table for discussion right now. And I think whenever whenever we're ready, any member can feel free to make a motion uh, pertaining to any of the of the articles. That's your cue. Mrs. Mahan. Since we are on Article 10, and this is the article I was told that the Select Board wasn't going to file this to further clarify our discretion and future discretion, town meeting procedure was, was. And to me, that's that. I would like to, for Article 10, um, move favorable, favorable action to uh, amend Title I, Article 1 of the town bylaws to allow any well, the the select board um, the discretion to set alternative dates for town meeting is, is that how I should say it tell me a better way to say it <laughs> no that's that's good that's fine it's <laughs> not. I'll, I'll try to get well to me article 10 we can make it a standalone regarding our initial inquiry, which is just to further clarify the discretion that the board already has to vote to amend Title I, Article I of the town bylaws to allow the select board to set the date for the beginning of annual town meeting. And we, we have some recommended language that I think could show up in the final votes and comments. Yeah. If we and you could clean it up from... Yeah, yeah thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the, yes, there is recommended language in, in Article 10 yeah, in the memo. 
Okay, all right, to see if the town will vote to amend Title I, Article I of the town bylaws to allow the select board to set alternative dates for the beginning of the annual town meeting or take any action related thereto. Second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Okay, so I'll take a crack at the other two. Go for it. Um, so I'm separating the, the date versus so, the time. So that's because, the date one. And so Article 8, I mean, we have to have a second individual recommendation on each, right? So I'll move favorable action on Article 8. Again, with the caveat that I think, in, the, in my opinion, in the, in the comments, we're pushing the time off for a vote. And at least for myself, I'm not taking a particular stance on, on the time. I'll do so as a town meeting member. Um, so I'll move favorable action on that one. And... With all due respect to Ms. Kelleher, even though it's very well thought out, I'll move no action on Article 9 just under the guise that I believe will have already disposed of it in Article 8. And we have a second? Yeah, I'll second. Okay. Both. All three. Um, all, yeah. all three, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, we need very good. Okay, so um, so we will so the, so it's favorable action in that town meeting. We think town meeting ought to vote on Article Eight, um, but we think that the what, what the time they choose is we don't have a recommendation at that time. We'll, 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 that's how I would yeah. place that's, it. Yeah, that's the motion on the table. Would, yep. Yeah, yeah, and we have a second for that, Mr. Gordon. Okay, just just a question, Mr. Chair. So the article calls for seven thirty, but you're suggesting, Mr. Hurd, a favorable action just to get it before Correct. town meeting. Um, <laughs> this is a dilemma here, isn't there? Uh, what's that? A bit of a dilemma. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, we've done it on resolutions, and we may have that discussion later yeah. on the final votes. I, I think particularly where you know, not all of us may vote for, for that or whoever the town meeting members are, I'd, I'd almost still consider a, a will report subject to feedback from town meeting to be... Um, the, and, and mm -hmm. it worked out with the moderator in terms of how that is, is put to town meeting members um, because you know, one of the things, if it comes down favorable action, and, and again, I, I, if, if, it, if town meeting wants 730, I'm just fine with 730. If they want seven, I'm just fine with seven. But I, I, it, if it comes down as a favorable action, 730, even with the comment that we still want to hear from town meeting, it, it seems to me that it, it's going to influence the vote. My, I don't think I'm saying that we want to hear from town meeting. Yeah. I'm just saying we're not, when it, and I think this has happened before, one article that town meeting was telling us to do something, and we're like, you know, we're not going to, but where it's something that just directly, I think what we're saying is we're pushing this, and what we've said before is we're voting no action, even though, you know, Three of us could say, no way, we want it to be 8 p.m. We're saying town meeting should vote on this and to you know, prevent the unnecessary step of someone having to do a substitute motion to get it back on the, in front of the floor. And so I think, to me, I think we can just vote positive action with the, with the intent that we're just putting, pushing this to town meeting for a vote. I, I don't say that we're... I mean, are you it, so are you suggesting that we just make clear in our comment that, you know, our intent is really to be very soft on the on the the actual time, you know, or, to let, or do we really defer to town meeting in this, or you know, what's we have to vote positive action in order to put it to town meeting for a vote. If we vote no action, it's not before town meeting without a substitute motion. Well, I think Mr. So, Corsi is suggesting a third course might be to do to, to decide here to do a re will report, which would basically postpone that until town meeting, and, and our printed report would just say, we'll get back to you. We'll report, yeah. That, we'll report. I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking, I mean, it still only requires one vote from us, and, and it could be the first night when, when town meeting is asked, when do you want to come back? And whatever that vote is, that's going to be our vote, and, and, and we just wouldn't do Article 10. We'd, we'd move to table that the first night of town meeting just so there's feedback. So there's, it's, at that point, town meeting is truly deciding what, what the time is. That's, but um, 
you leave a lot of other articles spending a lot of time on this, but it, it just, I, I think we all want feedback from town meeting. We all want town meeting to decide. It's just a question procedurally how that gets before them. Well, well I don't want to work go oh. circles on this. <laughs> I'll do whatever it <laughs> makes this easiest. Well, but I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not going to change my vote at town meeting based on. Yeah, and, and you don't have to. Tells me, oh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. 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 I'm perfectly happy to make a recommendation, but but me, but I'm just, I'm just trying to accommodate me, my colleagues here, so that we can. I'm not in a rush to make a decision, you know. Uh, but but I mean, I definitely have me my preference. I mean, I think I can I can defend it. I mean, um, I, I'd like to, as I say, take into account I mean, the ramifications of yep. changing the time, you know. Uh, but I would say, unless the ramifications were were really deleterious, I mean, I'm like totally in favor, I mean, of a 7:30 start time. You know, and, and, and very much in favor of seven o'clock, me, but totally in favor of the, of the seven thirty. You know, so. So, Mr. Did, does that may incline you to support the current motion on the table for favorable action or the potential second motion we could entertain, which would be to vote for a will report, which would postpone a recommendation until we we're into town meeting. Well, it, so I'm inclined to do a favorable action. We. Uh, not simply get it in front of town meeting, but to, to actually make a recommendation. Yeah. I mean, but I can go along with Mr. Mr. Hurd's recommendation because I was doing that left and right my first term. <laughs> it was more like it's like, well, I just want to get it in front of town meeting, you know. Uh, uh, and and I kind of learned from that first year that now nah, maybe I shouldn't just like try to put everything in front of town meeting you know, uh, for the sake of getting it there. And so I've tried to be a little more like definite about what my vote uh, means, you know. Uh, but. But, but I was just kind of countering what Mrs. DeCourcy said about like all of us, we just want to get in front of town meeting and let town meeting decide. It's like, no, nah, I'm happy. I'm happy to make a, like a strong recommendation for changing that time to 7.30, especially once we hear from the town meeting's procedure committee. You know, but you know, we can make that recommendation I mean, and then the town meeting procedure committee can meet and then go, well, the select board like made a mistake I mean, um, and, and just take it to account. And I guess we could change things. I mean, if they get back to us before I mean, we get our final vote and we could change it, but, but this is just how I feel. But once again, I, mean, I say that just to respond. I, mean, I, will, I will vote however most people want to go on this just because I mean, I'll be fine with the outcome. And is, is we're in this danger is of pushing 11 o'clock ourselves here. Uh, I tell you what, let, let's. My suggestion would be let's just to get let, let's get this one off of our plates tonight with with some kind of a vote, and then we can revisit this. Um, there may be some other um, <laughs> other input from other quarters um, in the final votes of comments, Mr. Uh, Attorney Cunningham. Yeah, Ms. Mr. Chair, I just note that Article Eight has a motion for favorable action that's been it it's been seconded. I was I was heading that way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any final any final comments on our course of action? Where we start voting on what <laughs> so, we have I mean, a motion so we have yeah, we, so let's th let's do article 10. okay um, let's get that so we have article 10 we have a motion for favorable action by mr mrs mahan is seconded by mr hurt any further discussion on article 10. all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed okay it's unanimous so that one's done now for article 9 we have a recommendation for no action by mr hurt second by mr diggins i think the intention of that is that we already have another one that does the same thing all in favor of that, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So it's a recommended no action, unanimous vote for Article 9. Now to Article 8. Um, I do have a question. We do have a question, Mrs. Uh, Mahan. Mr. Hurd, would you be amenable on Article 8 to uh, do a, what Mr. DeCourcy was saying as of right now, we'll report, um, and our report will be contingent upon whether we um, bring this back up for a vote at a regular select board meeting before town meeting if we get the report back from the town meeting procedures subcommittee or we'll report um, down on town meeting floor after town meeting members have the discussion the first night of town meeting i'm, I'm leaning yes. towards doing that is that okay so can you amend Whatever that? closes this article, okay. let's do it. <laughs> so on mr hurd's uh, motion to amend to will report i'd like to second Okay, so we have okay. an amendment to the mo a motion to, a, to change it to a will report, and we have a second to that by yeah. Mrs. Mahan. But ju just to be clear, though, we could revisit this before town meeting, depending yes. on whether we get yeah. okay. And I'd be happy to entertain that at the request of a board member. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. Yes. Okay, so on a motion uh, for a vote to will report on Article 8 by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
It is unanimous. Thank you very much, for, and thanks to all for your patience in uh, wading <laughs> through that. Okay, that brings us to Article 11, Bylaw Amendment, Fossil Fuel Bylaw Bylaw, Fossil Fuel Bylaw Language Changes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, consistent with my prior practice, yes. I'm going to recuse myself from this discussion, and, and maybe given the last discussion, it will make things go a little quicker. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Ms. And Fox, do you have any suggestion on how long of a time he should? No. <laughs> That's right. And uh, thank you very much for your patience, Ms. Fox. If you just reintroduce yourself to the, for the public's benefit. Hi, I'm Talia Fox, the sustainability manager for the town. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. So this presentation introduces Warrant Article 11, Fossil Fuel-Free Bylaw Language Changes. Next slide, please. The purpose of Warrant Article 11 is to see if the town will vote to amend the town's recently passed Fossil Fuel-Free Bylaw by altering, altering certain definitions such that they are more consistent with the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources Fossil Fuel-Free Demonstration Project Model Rule and the program regulations. Next slide, please. First, for some background, Arlington Special Town Meeting this past fall voted to adopt a new fossil fuel-free bylaw, which enables the town's participation in the Municipal Fossil Fuel-Free Building Demonstration Program, which I will refer to, refer to as the Demonstration Program to save some time for everyone. <laughs> Arlington was formerly, formally accepted into the program in February, and our bylaw officially takes effect on May 21st of this year. So I want to emphasize that if town meeting passes the proposed amendment summarized in this presentation, the amendment would not be included in the bylaw that takes effect on May 21st until it is approved by the Attorney General along with the other bylaw amendments passed at spring town meeting, just to clarify that. Um, so, uh, so DOER has recommended that Arlington revise the definition of major renovations in this bylaw. The suggested revision would add additions and changes of use to the definition of major renovations so that these types of renovation projects would also be required to be fossil fuel free. DOER's reasoning for this update is that it would align Arlington's definition with the intended definition put forth in the DOER model rule for communities participating in the demonstration program standardizing how the various bans across communities are applied. The update would also provide a more complete picture of the impact of banning fossil fuels and major renovations according to DOER. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, the fossil fuel free bylaw prohibits the installation of equipment or appliances that utilize fossil fuels as part of major renovations in addition to new construction. There are several exemptions in the bylaw for things like research and medical facilities, hot water and large buildings, modification of existing systems, and more. And there is also a process for waivers and appeals. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the types of projects that are currently included in the definition of major renovations. These projects are low-rise residential alterations exceeding half the existing conditioned space and commercial alterations exceeding half of the existing building or commercial alterations greater than 20,000 square feet. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the types of projects that would be additionally included in the definition of major renovations and therefore would be subject to the requirements of the bylaw. These projects are low-rise residential additions greater than 1,000 square feet or exceeding 100% of the existing conditioned floor area, commercial additions exceeding 20,000 square feet or exceeding 100% of the existing conditioned floor area, residential changes of use, so a change of use going from residential to another type of use over 1,000 square feet, and commercial changes of use exceeding 20,000 square feet or, or equal to the size of the existing space. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the expected impact of the definition change by presenting the number of projects in 2023 and 2022 that have exceeded, that exceeded the thresholds presented on the previous slide and that therefore would have been additionally required to comply with the bylaw as it is proposed to be amended. So to clarify, this would be on top of the roughly 40 to 50 projects per year that are considered alterations as part of the current definition, definition of major innovation in the bylaw. In 2023, Four residential additions would have been required to comply, and in 2022, two residential additions would be required would have been required <coughs> to comply uh, with the proposed amendments. There were no commercial additions or residential or commercial changes of use that exceeded the 
proposed thresholds in the modified definition. Next slide, please. So with that, I will conclude my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions that members of the board may have. Ryan Katofsky, chair of the Clean Energy Future Committee is still here, thankfully, <laughs> just in case we need his support uh, for questions as well. Still here, still awake as still we all here. are. Thank you very much, Ms. Fox. Any uh, additional comments from the town manager? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you to Ms. Fox and uh, Mr. Katofsky again for helping uh, sort of advance this effort. And I will say that, you know, this seems like something that is very reasonable for DOER to request of Arlington in terms of pursuing consistency among the model bylaws. And I just want to thank as well, while I have the opportunity, Mr. Champa for helping perform the work of determining exactly how many projects this would have impacted. I know that was certainly one of the questions I asked and I thought it would help uh, put this into context for the board to see that it's not necessarily a wide-ranging or far-reaching change. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciated that, that level of detail as well. Okay, so um, let's just go ahead and, and uh, do public hearing and then we'll just go back to the board. I think we can streamline the process. So if there's anybody uh, in the public on Zoom or in the room who wishes to comment on this article, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised. Okay, let's turn to the board. Mr. Hurd. Move positive action. Um, happy to support the changes. I think when this initial bylaw came out a few years back, people thought the, there'd be far reaching impacts, and some of the you know, naysayers kind of came down hard on it. And I don't think there's been anything but positive impacts. Year after year, the cleaner or electrified heat and cooling sources get better and you have more options whereas the fossil fuel apparatuses stay the same and get worse so i think um this even though we saw it, that it would affect a certain number of buildings it would only really affect them for the better ultimately so happy to support it thank you for your work on this mrs mahan um second and if I could ask my colleagues a request, and then if my colleagues agree to uh, town council, that we do include what town council included to us, his, um, I guess, second to last sentence, the top of page 14, uh, regarding that the proposed bylaw amendment does not eliminate the available exemptions or the option to pursue a waiver in cases where compliance with the bylaw renders a project financially infeasible or impractical to implement. That could definitely be somewhere in our final votes and comments, if that's okay. Thank you. I don't, while we're on that too, I would I'd suggest that we include some of the data, specifically the data that was in this presentation, not necessarily the slide, but just the the projected impact, which is you know very uh, very small um, of you know what this um, just a summary of that data on the on the uh, penultimate slide. Any further discussion? Great. I feel the same as my colleagues, so I won't. Uh, I won't repeat that. Um, so we have a motion for favorable action by Mr. Hurd and seconded by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. It's a four nothing vote with one um, recusal. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. On your way out, if you see uh, our, our stray board member, let him know that we're ready for him. <laughs> yes. yes. The lost sheep returns. <laughs> so this brings us now to final votes and comments. We have articles for review, Article 7, 12, 13, 23, 24, 36, 56, and 66. So for the public's benefit, what we're doing here is we've previously had article hearings, weren't article hearings on these articles, and the select board moved favorable or unfavorable action um, and gave general direction to town council. And so town council has in our packets um, drafted final votes and select board comments for it that will be published in a report. So what we're doing now is um, asking for any final edits and changes and then voting approval of the final language. So uh, let's just go one at a time and uh, I will let me see the best way to do this. Um, well, let's just, yeah, let's just go, we'll go one time. So let's start with Article 7. 
anyone has any motions or um, requests. Move approval. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Um, I do have one request on this, uh, if, if it's all right with my colleagues, um, and that is I thought that the write-up was good, but I would suggest, uh, Attorney Cunningham, that if you or your team would add the uh, explanation as to the reasons for these changes, which were actually was language that was uh, that was in your initial memo to us on the night of the hearing, that just explained the rationale, um, so that we have not only the what but but also the why um, for e each component of the of the changes. Um, and I think that language, as I said, is is already there in your previous memo. Will do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments on Article Seven? So. Um, I'm sorry, who was the second on that? Did we have a second? Diggins. Mr. Diggins. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion to approve funding votes and article, comments on Article 7 by Mrs. Mahad, seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. Thank you very much. Article 12, bylaw amendment, John J. Bill for Article Arlington Citizens Scholarship Fund. Any comments or questions from the board or motions? Move approval. Okay. Second. Big in the seconds. Uh, yep. Gotcha. Yes, thank you. The no problem. The reliable book ends here. <laughs> um, did you have anything other, Mr. Corsi? I did, did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and um, just in section four of that, I did spoke about this with uh, Attorney Cunningham, and I think it, it may be in a, a, a final version. Um, we talk about all of the, the various principals who are permanent members of the scholarship committee. And uh, we want to say, or their designees at the end, at, at, at adding an S. So with, the, with that change, I'd second that, it. That change makes sense, Mr. Chair. I'll make that change in the final. Excellent. Any further discussion? So on a motion for uh, approval by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. So Article 13, bylaw amendment, leaf blower dates of transition. This was ultimately a recommendation of no action following the town manager's request. Turn to the board for motions. Move approval. All right. Second. All right, we have any further discussion. We have a motion to approve by Mrs. Mahan, a second by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Article 23, endorsement of CDBG application. Colleagues. Motions, discussion. Move approval. Okay. Second. All right. And any discussion of the final votes of comments for Article 23? Okay. So all in favor on the motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Unanimous. Do we have, oh wait, did you say abstain? Attorney Cunningham, do you, do you want me to abstain? Because oh. I was. Yes. yes. Okay, so let's revote on that one. Yep. Um, so we have, uh, Mr. Hurd suggesting he abstains because he's a member of the committee? Or no, yeah. because I wasn't there. Oh, even better. Okay, so we have um, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed and abstain. Abstain. Okay, so we have a four uh, yeses and one abstain. Thank you. Article 24, revolving funds. Turn to my colleagues. Move approval. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Oh. All right. <laughs> toes, You're all serious right. now. It's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion? Okay. We have a motion for approval by Mrs. Mahan, second by Metro DeCourcy. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Oh, we an anima, uh, unanimous, uh, both one abstention. So we have four yeses and one abstain. Article 36, endorsement of parking benefit district <clears throat> expenditures. Move approval. Thank you. All right, we have a second. <laughs> all right, any discussion? So all in favor on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Diggins, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Oh, oh, yes. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm noting in the comment for Article 36 a reference to PIGSI, which is 
uh, outdated and no longer the name of the Parking Advisory Committee. Oh, so good catch. Just throw that out there for consideration in the Parking final vote. Implementation Governance Committee. Thank God we got rid of that one. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Attorney Gunningham. Mr. Chair will make that change. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that understanding, are we comfortable with just proceeding with that prior vote with that understanding? All right, very good. So we have, um, we had four in favor and abstain on that one as well? Okay. Article 56, local option and acceptance of MGL Chapter 203C, the prudent investor rule. Prudently move approval. <laughs> okay, we have a motion to approve by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Unanimous. Article 66, resolution, MBTA service. Um, Mr. DeCorsi, do you want to make any comments on this? Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as we had discussed at the, the hearing, Mr. Schlickman and I spoke, and there's some language that has been added that just shows a, a comparison between Arlington um, and, and other communities in terms of what our multiplier is. There was some language that specifically referenced Quincy that was removed from the resolution. So we, we had a good back and forth, and, and um, we also included uh, Attorney Cunningham. And um, Mr. Schlickman is comfortable, I'm comfortable, so uh, I'd move approval. Thank you. Very Favorable much. action. Yeah. And, and if I could, yeah. I did have a discussion with the town moderator, Mr. Christiana, uh, during my break. <laughs> and and um, yes. they really, he didn't really see a way that this could go to town meeting without a recommendation from us. So it would, even if we did nothing, there'd have to be a substitute motion. So I think for purposes of, of um, getting it before town meeting, I'd move favorable action. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your good legwork on that, yeah, Mr. DeCourcy. Um, so we have approval of the final votes and comments. And so this is, I think, uh, worth pointing out because we had a dissenting member on the yeah. original vote yeah. that you know that, that that original vote stands right that Mr. Dickens was opposed um, but so what's your guidance attorney Cunningham on on the nature of the final if Mr. Dickens wants to still maintain that vote should he vote no on these approving the final votes and comments as well thank or, you Mr. Or yes to approve the re record of his negative vote <laughs> thank you Mr. Chair I, I obviously it's up to Mr. Diggins but uh, I think for clarity's sake, it could probably be a negative vote on both. But again, that's Mr. Diggins' discretion. You, you have your advice, Mr. Diggins. Well, I, mean, I, could, a question? I could approve the comments I mean, for the final report. I mean, so I'm going to do that. I'm sticking with my negative vote. And I'm also going to compliment you on capturing I mean, the essence of my thoughts and feelings. I mean, you did, you did a very good job. I thought I was going to have to, like, Offer to do an edit, you know, uh, because I didn't think you had a whole lot to go on because the art the discussion was truncated a bit, but you did an excellent job. I mean, so thank you. Uh, so I'm staying with my no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you can vote yes. All these final votes oh, yeah. don't yeah. go to town meeting. Yeah, just no. Clean it up. Yeah, just clean it up. But it's you vote, you be you, you do yeah. what you got to do. Attorney Gilliam. I know it's late, but also I wanted to note that trying to capture the yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, no use of the word urges in any of these draft votes or comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no urges were harmed. Yes. Well, <laughs> that's very gratifying, Attorney Cunningham. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I believe we still need a second on this approval. Now I'm going to double check. Second. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? So, on a motion to approve the final vote and comment for Article 66 by Mr. DeCourcy and seconded by Mrs. Mahan. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Unanimous, uh, unanimous except uh, one abstention. So four yes and one abstain. Okay, that brings us to new business. Except in cases of emergency, the board will neither deliberate nor act upon topics presented in new business. Ms. Mar. No new business, thank you, Mr. Chair. Attorney Cunningham. Sorry, Mr. Chair, this is very much worth at least a minute of time, though I just wanted to... So introduce a uh, new deputy town council who started last week, attorney Jacqueline Munson, who's still here tonight. Um, and is, in her first week has been great. I think that you know her experience, her uh, expertise, her enthusiasm for municipal law are gonna really serve the town of Arlington very well. Uh, we're really excited to welcome attorney Munson on board. She's already proven to be a great asset, uh, worked extensively on these draft votes and comments and, and, and the Warren article memos for the board. So I'm really excited to have Attorney Munson on board and can't wait for her to 
get more involved in, in everything that she wants to get involved in here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Trevini. No new business. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, just one thing. Um, the award by, uh, facilitated by Congresswoman Catherine Clark that the town manager, Mr. Trevini, um, advised us of that the now Mystic River Watershed has um, put out a um, posting on their Facebook and on their website uh, regarding the approximately $957,000 plus dollars that was um, obtained for funding um, largely based in whole on our town engineer Wayne Chenard, is that his correct title? Town engineer Wayne, Wayne Chenard's mo model that uh, he conceptualized and um, created, implemented, and, and uh, is, is sort of the crux of um, the, the reason for this funding and how we're going to move forward on it with um, a future commitment after the town goes through the proper um, consulting and planning for probably a bigger project after that. That's really good news, and I know we've all had com conversations with the town manager as well as um, additional conversation that, you know, perhaps in the fall, um, September to end of October, um, working with Congresswoman Clark's office, um, have something where we um, can have some sort of event with a Congresswoman and or anyone else who the town manager deems is appropriate, whether it's for my, Mr. River Watershed um, and uh, whomever else uh, have an event something in the future to meet face to face for thanks, but also to continue with our commitment in federal dollars and others commitment moving on forward to the larger project that this will be working towards. That's it for new business. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, very briefly, um, we had a, uh, well, at our, our last meeting or maybe two meetings ago, we approved a, a license for the kilos, uh, Takaria, I may be uh, saying the name wrong. Uh, um, Mr. Herrera and his nephew were in here. Um, the Globe had a story about the successful opening of the restaurant, and, and um, in the article, he was quoted of saying, I just love the way they th do things here in Arlington. And I, I, would, I spoke to Mr. Feeney about it and, and wanted to commend him and his team, um, inspectional services, planning, health department, fire department, police department, because in order to get that license, he was engaging with every, uh, all of those departments, and uh, he had a, a great experience, and we appreciate him saying that in the, in, in the newspaper as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. No new business, Mr. Chair. I have no new business other than to welcome Attorney Munson. Thank you for coming to Arlington. Thank you for staying tonight. I'll be especially happy if you stay on after, after the long select board meeting tonight. Just wait till town meeting. And uh, yes, I uh, entertain a motion to move to adjourn. Second. A motion to adjourn by Mrs. Mahan and seconded by Mr. Diggins. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.